Hello, everybody. Hello. All good. All right, we are going to begin. Hey, everybody. So, firstly, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here to celebrate endings and beginnings, which I'll talk about in a little moment. Thank you, everyone online who's tuning in from all around the world. Um, and yeah, I just want to uh, explain firstly why is only half of Rebel Wisdom here. So David has been um, really struggling with his health recently um, and is, is very burned out. And so we were trying to find a way that he could um, attend today and, and make, make it not, not too overwhelming, but it was just a, a bit too much. So today, David is very much here in spirit and I really wanna bring him into the room, but he's not gonna be physically here. He's, he's just um, not really well enough to, to do so. so of course, it's very emotional for me. I would really love him to be here, but I completely, of course, understand um, if you're not doing well and it's, it's just too much, it's, it's just the way it is. So um, yeah, I thought maybe we could we could send him um, a lot of love just to start with. Um, uh, yeah, give him a round of applause. So what we will be doing is um, Jonathan Rousen from Perspectiva will come up in a moment, talk a little bit about what, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we're both doing next and, and Jonathan will talk a little bit about what David's doing next um, because we both have, um, in a way, like I said, this is a day of, of endings, but it's also a day of beginnings. And I think both what, what David and I are doing next is very much in the spirit of rebel wisdom and is gonna be happening within a kind of wider network that I don't, maybe we can figure out today what we call the, the, the corner of the internet and the kind of line of inquiry that, that so many of us are interested in. Some people call it the, the sense-making web, uh, the meta web. I don't know, I just made that up. But there's, um, you know, there's very much, um, yeah, our intention is very much that we're, where rebel wisdom ends because, you know, what we were set up, when we set up in, in 2018, it was um, it wasn't that long ago, and <laughs> a lot has happened, as we know. It was Brexit and Trump, and it was the sort of post-truth. The, the, thank you. Yes, the realities of a post-truth world. And what David and I really connected around was this feeling of what isn't being expressed in the culture, and the fact that what isn't being expressed is is driving so much of the polarization and driving so much of our inability to have conversations um and so that that at the time really felt uh super alive and i think i'll still i still think it's incredibly relevant um and then as time went on you have obviously the world change and the, the sort of um being the rebels in a way feels less important than finding a new synthesis moving forward um and for, for both me and david we both have visions of what that synthesis looks like which are which are somewhat divergent but also similar in some ways as well so um we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment and, and jonathan will give a little bit more context just about today so um today is a very participatory day uh and it's really about you guys it's about rebel wisdom it's a really oh there, there we go you you know we created a, a platform and a container and and perhaps a particular um ethos, I, I suppose we could call it, um, a way of coming together, a way of bringing together sort of personal growth practices with cultural conversations. Um, but it was really everyone who watched, everyone who engaged, everyone who did our courses, everyone who filled the container, that was magical. And that's why it's, it's actually very touching. It's just touching to be sort of sandwiched between um, people in the room and people uh, online, because also like during COVID, especially, we had an incredible community um, of, of online, um, you know, we're doing like three things a week at times. Uh, and then there's a new community that sprang out of that called Emergent Commons, which Adriana and Nick will be talking about later on as we as we near the end of the day, looking to the kind of what's pollinating, right? What, what's emerging from from one thing ending and, and something in the beginning. Um, and then practically you have the schedule right after this introduction um, and Jonathan comes up 
uh, John Verveke will very kindly lead us through a contemplation practice um, to just kind of get us contemplative um, and get us dropped in a little bit. Then we're going to move into breakouts, which I'll t explain the logistics of that um, in a little bit. But we have the whole venue, so we'll use the, the whole space except for the study, which is our sort of storage room and, and kind of um, green room. So, uh, but that'll all be made clear. Um, I just, uh, we have a really great team of volunteers who might stand up if you can. Yay, so we got Eileen in the back. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Eileen's the only volunteer in the room right now. So, hey, Eileen. Um, so then we have Marta, who, who you, is Marta? Uh, Marta, hey. Yeah, great. So Marta has been an amazing part of the team for probably six, six months, eight months, maybe longer. Yeah. So Marta is sort of coordinating the volunteers uh, and we have a few more people coming. So if if someone has a name badge on, they're basically just going to be mainly what the volunteers are doing is just helping us move through the space and fill the breakout rooms, etc. So I kind of look out for the name badges. Um, yes. And then before I invite Jonathan up, I also just wanted to share my intention for today and what I've really been feeling over the last six months or so, um, which is around endings and around the ending of Rebel Wisdom, which is a, a real desire to simultaneously hold two things at once without completely collapsing into one of them or the other, which really speaks to so much of what we've been trying to do with Rebel Wisdom. So holding it at one time ending and, and the finality of ending and really being with that and with just as much heart and passion holding new beginnings so that we're not holding one or the other but that we're actually holding both of them really fully with all of ourselves throughout today and that's really what i've been trying to do um yeah over the last uh over the last six or eight months or so um so yeah i'm gonna invite uh jonathan up just to talk about what's what's happening more, more broadly as, as rebel wisdom ends thank you sir Okay, I'll, I'll sit then. Um, thank you so much, Ali. And uh, I only discovered I'll be speaking this morning, uh, early, late afternoon yesterday. Um, and what I have to say is delicate um, and important. So bear with me as I think it through as I speak. There's um, a bit closer, yeah. Um, I speak here with uh, three hats on, in a sense. Only one scarf, of course, but three hats. Um, and those hats are personal, They're just me as someone who's enjoyed Rebel Wisdom, they're my professional role as director of Perspectiva, and there's also my kind of community hat of representing what Ali was alluding to earlier, this uh, elusive community that's sprung up. So let me take them in turn. On a personal level, I speak as one of all of you, as someone who has loved Rebel Wisdom, who has been on their show a few times. I was. Um, invited on by David to speak to um, Peter, Peter, Jordan Petersonitis. Petersonitis, Peterson, of course, was a big part of the early story of Rebel Wisdom, and laterally, uh, you know, more, a more interesting, uh, challenge, you know, contested part, perhaps. And that was in the woods and a very memorable conversation with David. I've also had a lovely conversation with John Verveke, whom you'll see later today, which was memorable in its own way, too. And uh, I was asked to speak to um, my love of Robert Persig in the, in the book club. And all of those things were very precious to me personally. Um, but beyond that, I'm like all of you. I'm the guy listening to any one of the great figures they've had on the show while I'm doing the dishes, while I'm doing the shopping, while I'm um, taking the kids to school sometimes with one, one, one headphone on and one off so I can hear the kid, but I'm still like what Daniel Schmachtenberger just said or whatever. So. I'm one of, I'm, I, I'm with Rebel Wisdom in that sense. And on, on that sense, I want to just begin by saying something, keeping very much David's presence in mind. Great tragedy that he can't be here today, but I also saw him yesterday, and I have his permission and Ali's to speak to this. But not just their permission, I want all of us to just say, fabulously well done. You guys have done something extraordinary. <laughs> And 20, 
2018 when it began, um, I actually met David first of all in 2015. For those who remember, there was an alter ego gathering in 2015 where I first met David. And already there, he was kind of thinking things through. And then there was a, a gestation with Ali that gave birth to Rebel Wisdom. Um, 2018 is very different from 2022. It's a very different world. We've gone through something. But Rebel Wisdom has taken us through that time. There's a sense in which the sense-making process was carried, carried a community and also built one at the same time. It met a need of the moment. The need of today is somewhat different, but it remains true that the interiority of human beings, the ultimate nature, meaning, and purpose of life, the attempt to get beyond facile problem solving, to make sense in a broader, fuller, deeper way, to bring your full self to your life remains an imperative a cultural imperative, a civilizational survival imperative. So Rebel Wisdom has performed an enormous service to the community. And I say that I share that as, with my personal hat on, um, because when I come to the next hat, I just want you to know that, you know, I bring with it a love of what has been done and the respect for it and admiration. At times, even an envy, if I'm fully honest, because they just did so very well so quickly. They were really like a meteorite shining in the sky and just did one amazing thing after the other. So now here we are in 2022, and um, they've taken the difficult decision, difficult, resolute, admirable decision to end, to feel the need to end and to close. It's one of the toughest things in life in any capacity, just at a personal level, um, with another kind of another hat. I used to play chess professionally, and one of the hardest things I ever did was just let it go. I, I don't think I'll ever be as good at anything else. And the room reminds me of that, actually, a little bit with the black and white. But um, but I, I, um, I, I really admire that capacity to know when to say goodbye. But even when you find the courage for that, there is a deeper challenge of the skill of how to end, not just to end, which is, requires resolve and courage and tenacity, but then a kind of discernment and patience and um, consideration and sensitivity to the new moment and to the people still involved. So the question for those who love rebel wisdom is, what becomes of what has ended now that the ending has happened? I say that knowing that, in a sense, for people attending here today, this is actually the beginning of the end, in a sense, because you have a whole day of delicious, full activity ahead. So we're not quite there. But um, I speak on behalf of Ali called it the meta web briefly. It's been called the liminal web, the sense making web. Personally, and I'm going to make a pitch here. Um, I found that the word that is most encompassing for me and works that brings all of the different groups in, which includes quite a diverse bunch of people, right, who don't always agree politically, often have different spiritual outlooks, different sensibilities, different senses of what we should talk about. I feel I like I now call that group the, the, the post conventional world or the post conventional community. It's just a way of saying people who are beyond, in some language beyond game A, in some language seeking a new kind of wisdom, in some language trying to make sense, but it's beyond convention. It's beyond what has come before. It's an attempt to build a new world. And that's where we are. And many people now are beginning new initiatives as a result of the inspiration of rebel wisdom often, inspired to create new communities, new institutions which are needed. Now, with that in mind, I come to my other hat, which is director of Perspectiva. Perspectiva is a charity. We're a not-for-profit organization. That's quite important to stress because Rebel Wisdom was a company, a for-profit and successful com commercial entity um, that could have carried on had they wanted to, doing courses and you know building memberships and carrying on in that regard. What was always clear, however, was that in addition to that, it was a community asset. It's also an educational asset and a philosophical resource. So the question is, as the entity ends, what becomes of the educational and cultural resources that remain available from Rebel Wisdom? Ali mentioned it's very important to both end and allow for new beginnings. So it's important to understand there is no question of rebranding. There's no question of just a fresh lick of paint, as they say, or a new name. It's not as simple as that. Something has to end. There really is a time to close something, to be with that ending, to process it before anything else can arise. And I say that also mindful of David and where he is at the moment and how he is 
that time is needed to allow something to end, to process that, to recover, renew, and then listen for the wellsprings of renewal. But while you're doing that, something has been created that still, is still extant, it's still there. There is a, about a quarter of a million YouTube subscribers, for one thing. There's a large newsletter um, community that is still waiting for information and content. So the story now happens as a kind of birth, really, because Ali has a very exciting near future ahead with a new book coming out and new ventures of various kinds. And, you know, he will take that path. And I believe the bigger picture is one of the main uh, names for it. And um, meanwhile, it's not quite clear what will happen on the other side in terms of the substance and name, because we don't want to rush that. But what I can tell you in its form and its sort of morphology is that what's going to happen next is we're going to create make make of the prior rebel wisdom a community asset something that is shared by this post-conventional world if you want to call it something else you're welcome by the way and we can talk about that later we might even make that part of the design challenge um, it's going to be available so that um, people who are doing similar work still have that chance to broadcast their work, still have a chance to reach the wider world. Um, and those who are already interested in rebel wisdom and have come for rebel wisdom still, still recognize discernibly that this is part of the same journey, but it will have a new name and a new emphasis that's more suitable for 2022 and beyond. Ali mentioned synthesis. There will be aspects of that. There will also be aspects of you know, what is the nature of the new world forming? who is actually helping to build new possibilities from the learnings of the post-conventional world. What is it like to have new capacities for wisdom at scale, inst culturally, institutionally? How do they feed into institutional forms? What becomes of people who change their life and build new communities? What kind of world is that? What do we know of it? So we will be looking for patterns of renewal that are informed by the the new wisdom that's been brought into being through rebel wisdom. And we don't know what we're going to call it yet. And we don't even want, we do have some backroom chat about what we might call it, but I'd rather keep that away until we give time for the dust to settle. Um, Perspectiva will manage that. Um, curious thing, you don't know what's going to happen to your career. I, I was a few, you know, six years ago, I was traveling around the world playing chess, give or take, and then I one thing led to another, I got a job, um, and then through that job I wrote about climate change and spirituality, I realized it was kind of the same question, fundamentally, and I later met Thomas, who was wrestling with similar things, we ended up creating this entity called Perspectiva, and at that time it was meant to be a kind of research institute, it was designed to be a thought leadership vehicle, writing books and articles, but what actually happened was, um, we found this wider network was springing up around us, including Rebel Wisdom, which are kind of siblings in a sense. And the reason that matters is that we, we changed, we morphed into something. We've, we've now got a publishing arm. We have this Emerge network that we're in charge of. There is this realization festival that's another kind of partnership. And so the sort of the evolution of things has meant that we've become this incubator of sorts. I sometimes even think of ourselves as foster parents. There's a kind of like looking after things that, that, that are not entirely ours, but responsibility towards. And that's why when this situation arose of how to end well, it suddenly occurred to me to offer them, look, we can do this. You wanna make it a community asset? We know how to do that. We know the people, we, we share some of your underlying philosophical vision. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, it will take a bit of time. Um, it will work. David will play a leading role in it. We very much, you know, I want you to know that we have those best interests very much at our heart, and it won't work without that. Actually, at some level, it, 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 we're, we're we're very keen that that's a part of it. But we're going to bring in other people and renew as well. So um, I'll end with a Churchill Churchill line just to uh, increase the energy before you leave. There's a famous wartime moment where Churchill speaks of uh, endings and beginnings. Um, I'm tempted to do a Churchill impersonation, but I won't risk it. Um, he says, um, this is not the beginning. This is not the end. This is not the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the begin. The end of the might be the end of the beginning. Now, the end of the beginning for you today, um, because um, 
sorry, excuse me, the beginning of the end for you today, the end of the beginning for the network. That was my point. So in other words, you're about to start something and this is the end of the beginning session, but the wider community, uh, sorry, I'm kind of confused. <laughs> Okay. One more time, one more time. Okay. Okay. It's the end of the beginning of this session today. And that was my point. But it's the beginning of the end. No, it's not a way around. <laughs> right, I'm not going to try again. You know exactly what I mean. The, the, the community aspect of this is that while It's the end of the beginning of this session, right? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. It really was a, if it makes you feel any better, I, at a workshop I was leading last weekend, I tried to deliver Ian McGilker's line that it's neither e either or or both and but either or and both and but i was like <laughs> same thing same thing happened it was incredibly difficult but yeah thank you and and so um yeah i think jonathan laid it out really nicely we'll, we'll be doing an announcement to to the to uh the mailing list around this exactly what's what's happening what people can expect as well i'm going to continue using and uh writing on the Substack. um that's currently the rebel wisdom sub stack but we'll we'll become the bigger picture which is um both the name of my book, but also um, the, what I'm interested in. And I think what, what many of us are interested in is, is really understanding how do we make sense of the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, and yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that um, as we'll, we'll have more information on that. I really, I'm quite conscious and keen for today as, as well as being what we're doing next to be really honoring rebel wisdom and, and, and um, yeah, bringing it to an end and seeing what pollinates as well. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention a name that Jonathan mentioned, Thomas, Thomas Bjorkman. Um, Thomas gave us our uh, early funding for Rebel Wisdom and changed our lives in the process. So, Thomas, I want to say thank you. And um, much of that network that Jonathan was talking about, Rebel Wisdom, you know, that's why we have often referred to, uh, to Perspectiva or Emerge as sister networks, without really kind of explaining why sometimes we just did that. that that's why, because um, Thomas and, and Jonathan and others have really built a, a really amazing network of this kind of liminal web, whatever you want to call it. So, um, great. <sighs> okay, so we're going to... Uh, now go into breakouts. Okay, let's get started. So please find your seats and your no doubt very interesting conversations. Great. Okay, so we're going to um, John Verveke is going to come, in, come up in a can you hear me? Is this microphone okay? Yeah, it's fine. John, John is going to come up in a moment. Um, and after that, Aisha Akanbi as well, before lunch. After lunch, we have open space for different practices, which I'll talk about before lunch. I also just wanted to, because we've started the day and we're about to go into the content, I just wanted to also um, leave maybe, have, have maybe a minute to just be with... Um, well, be with David in some sense and just kind of bring him into the room and just allow the feelings of, of him not being here to, to just be kind of there and process it a little bit. I don't want to overrun it as well. I also know that he is very keen that it doesn't sort of um, dominate the day and that we still have that aliveness and we still have that um, space. But I think, I think in order to do that, just, just maybe just a few moments that we just sit with that so that we can be with it and then keep I am going to stand up first. Then. I'm excited about what we have coming up all day, but especially uh, about what we have coming up right now. And so, John Verveke, I have to say, John has probably been the most influential person on my thinking that we've um, 
had on Rebel Wisdom in so many ways. I've had the great pleasure and feel incredibly lucky actually to have spent, I think, 64 sessions overall doing Sense Making 101, eight of them with John, um, and really, and of course, reading his work and watching his work on YouTube. Um, yeah, has, has really been instrumental for, for, for both me and David and, and the project as a whole. And we wanted to start with John because the concept of the meaning crisis and John's thought is very wide ranging and also uh, transcends and includes the meaning crisis, I think. But I wanted to start with the meaning crisis because this has been something that we looked at in depth at Rebel Wisdom and really felt very strongly throughout was that what some people have called the God-shaped hole in society, uh, which I think uh, the, the meaning crisis is, is more than that, but this sense of a lack of purpose, direction, and meaning in culture feels absolutely crucial. And it, and it feels really difficult to talk about what's going on in the world and to talk about the symptoms we're seeing without getting an understanding of that underlying concept. So we wanted to start the day with John. And I'd like to invite you up, John, and please give him a huge round of applause. So what side do you want me on? I should, I'll be here. Keep locking out the, um, yeah. But okay. Okay, for you guys, you can see us, yeah, all right. So, and by the way, we're a little bit behind schedule, so what we're gonna do is shorten the break. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we'll have a we'll have a comfort break, but then Aisha will will come on, so we'll have maybe kind of a five minute period where if you need to use the bathroom, you do. But we're just going to go through. So, John, firstly, thank you for being here. I'm really glad to be here. I really wanted to be here. And okay, so I'm sorry about this question, <laughs> but I had the real sense of wanting to ask you. Um, you released Awakening from the Meaning Crisis a couple of years ago, right? 2019. 2019. Do you feel we are awakening from the meaning crisis? So I was at a, a conference called the Consciousness and Conscience Conference in, of all places, Thunder Bay, Ontario. We had a lot of people there. <clears throat> and this will actually address your question. Um, and everybody was talking about a sense of momentum that things are happening, there's a sense of convergence, um, post-conventional convergence, um, and, and something's emerging. And so I'm probably speaking out of some selection bias because people more and more want to talk to me about this issue, but, but all the people I were talking to about how this is stirring up in their lives and their communities and uh, people are addressing it. So I think there is definitely something that's taking shape, even taking on a life of its own and gaining momentum. I don't know about how well it is doing with respect to all of the deleterious forces that are also accelerating. Um, so the answer is, <laughs> you're gonna hate this, maybe. <laughs> uh, because there's, there, it's not just an idea, like there's, emerging communities of practice emerging and where we, we had a meeting in Vermont of many of the leaders of these emerging communities and we're federating together we're producing a meta curriculum on how to design an ecology of practices a vetting process so that we prevent each other from becoming gurus or anything strange like that um, all of that's happening um, but again also the way things are the meta crisis and the, the deleterious impact on people's lives, that's all, all those forces are also accelerating. So that's how it seems to me right now. And probably um, most of us will have some kind of sense of the, what the meaning crisis is, but it, it might actually be good to de define it, especially if anyone is <laughs> um, kind of a little bit new to it. But yeah, I mean, and, and has your conception of it changed since, since you began this kind of journey around it? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna give an answer and it'll take about 50 hours. Um, so, the way I, I usually try to talk about it is, some, and I've done this, many of you might have heard this before, and I apologize, because it's come up in the courses. 
but there's some core themes. Um, one is the, the very dynamic and self-organizing processes that make us adaptively intelligent, make us perennially susceptible to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, both individually and collectively. What I can say about change on that dimension is not just my own, but in collaboration with other people, the scientific thinking about that has become more precise. Just recently published a paper, um, like just a month ago, um, in the Journal of Phenomenology and Cognitive Sciences, integrating the relevance realization framework with the other big framework, the predictive processing framework. And this is a big thing scientifically. So what I can say is, um, it, People are interested in more the, the scientific nuts and bolts. There's been, I think, a considerable step forward there. I, I th that may be the most important scientific paper I publish in my career. Um, we'll see. I, mean, I, may, I might get hit by a bus tomorrow. So, uh, but it, it's, I think it's very important. So the idea is, but for us, the idea is these processes are so powerful and so complex but and at the same time, that means in, in ways that are sort of ungraspable from our egocentric awareness, we, we are susceptible to very powerful and self-organizing patterns of self-deception and self-destructive behavior. And so we need ecologies of practices to intervene on that in order to reduce it. Now that adaptivity isn't it isn't cold computational calculation. It's like in the exercise. It was the contact. Whenever you're touching, you're being touched. It's the contact, and, and I'm caring about this rather than that. That that adaptivity is that that caring contact, and that sense of caring connectedness is what makes your life meaningful to you. The more you feel regularly and reliably that caring connectedness to yourself to other people and to the world, and you just did it with the world, and that's why it matters, the more you feel that your life is worth the inevitable frustrations and pain of being a human being. So you need practices that not only ameliorate the self-destruction, the self-deception, which hampers and undermines that caring connectedness, but practices that cultivate it and curate it and create it where it's missing and develop it. And you need those two to be integrated together because they are. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And so wisdom, I used to say, put on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia. But if you can put one more thing, <laughs> it's gonna get big, I guess. One more thing, wisdom is not optional. Wisdom is not optional. And if you don't care about it, you are in, you are fettered, fettered to processes of self-deception, self-destruction, individually and collectively that steal your life away from you. And if you don't, if you think you can ignore this, that is itself a supreme act of self-deception. Wisdom is not optional. So cross time, Across history and culture, contexts, people have come up with these ecologies of practices. This is why rebel wisdom has emerged. But here's the thing. These ecologies of practices for the cultivation of wisdom, the enhancement of meaning in life, they can't just happen beliefs. Our culture is so obsessed with beliefs. It has to happen at all the levels of virtue, all the levels of knowing. You have to get the right skills, you have to be able to take the right perspectives. You have to be able to cultivate your character. You have to be able to generate that living connection, communitas, as Turner called it. A place that used to do that at all those levels of the psyche, all those level, corresponding levels of the world, individually and collectively, was religion. That's what religions did. They did a lot of other things. But I would argue and I've argued it, what made them survive was this powerful adaptive function. Now for many of us, the legacy religions, religions that were born in the Axial Revolution are no longer viable for us for a whole host of reasons I won't review. 
but what's undeniable is that the, grow, the, the fastest growing demographic group, and it will soon be the largest in all Western societies, are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They do not belong to any official religion, but they are not sort of village atheists. Most of them describe themselves with this nebulous, unhelpful, but somewhat comforting phrase, I'm spiritual but not religious, which means like, think about this. Spiritual. So you believe in spirits. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. They describe their spirituality as primary one of seeking. The meaning crisis is people are seeking, but they're not finding. They don't know where to go to cultivate wisdom. I do this regularly with my students. I'll say, where do you go for information? They hold up their phones immediately because they're all cyborgs. <laughs> where do you go for knowledge? And they're sort of influenced by postmodernism, so they, they hum and haw a little bit, but they're in the university and they're taking a class with me. So they say, science? <laughs> That's a problem too, but we'll talk about that another, another time. And then I say, where do you go for wisdom? And you get a stony, dangerous silence. Remember, wisdom isn't optional. So the meaning crisis is wisdom isn't optional. The traditions we had where we went to home, the ecologies of the practices for the cultivation of wisdom and the enhancement of meaning are no longer, and we'd have to take this seriously, are no longer viable options for people. They're seeking, but the world is not, I mean, Western culture, whatever Western means, sort of post-European, post-Christian world, right, is not disposed to help them with that. And so they do it autodidactically. And some of that can succeed. And autodidactic is better than nothing, but only a little bit. Because the problem with autodidactic is it tends to reinforce the biases, the egocentrism, the tendencies towards narcissism, etc that we're trying to ameliorate with our wisdom practices. So we have a growing problem in the Western world, and it's now entered the DSM as an official sort of problem of spiritual bypassing, which is people are doing sort of, they want, they're, they're treating spirituality as a commodity that you acquire in order to feel better. And that means why it's called spiritual bypassing is they're, they're pursuing spirituality, but they're bypassing their moral, epistemic, cultural, and aesthetic obligations. That's the meaning crisis. Thank you. Brilliant. Really brilliant. Um, this, this really touches on something that I've, I've wrestled with a lot, which is if we don't know where to go for wisdom, and our traditional, say, axial age, Christian religions, Christianity, perhaps Buddhism, lots of other religions, world religions are not, you know, we see declining attendance, they're just not um, perhaps fit for purpose right now, leaves us in quite a quandary because it's really difficult to start a new religion. And most of them, <laughs> please don't try, um, most of them don't work. I, I, I researched this a lot for my book and especially the, the nuns and, and that, that rise. And especially in the context of psychedelics, I was thinking, well, there are new psychedelic religions forming and they're, you know, they, they're quite <laughs> problematic, a lot of them. At the same time, one of the most successful is Santo Daime, which combines Christianity with, the, with ayahuasca, with the practice. So I guess my question is, and I think it applies to all of us because it applies to these communities of practice that we're all part of. On the one hand, it might be that you know, like early Christianity, when you've spoken to this before, these communities of practice are resilient enough to thrive and expand and become something that has mainstream penetration, which has always been a hope of mine. At the same time, I don't know whether that is how to do that, certainly, but also could a revival of existing religions be an option as well? That's what I'm curious about, which uh, maybe there's a third option or many more. Yeah. First of all, don't start your own religion. So if you remember anything from today, don't start your own religion. Um, and I want to say this explicitly one more time. 
I'm not trying to do that. Okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to discern where it might be happening and see how I can most wisely commit myself to helping it give birth. That's my project. If you don't mind the being irreligious, because I don't mean to be irreligious, I'm not Jesus, I'm John the Baptist. I, I want to find what's coming and, and point it out. And it helps that he was called John, so that helps too. Uh, so on that point, um, one point on the psychedelics, and, and I mentioned this to Ali, I just released an essay on uh, the Institute for Art and Ideas about psychedelics and getting closer to reality. And I tried to make a distinction, and this is partly towards the answer. The reason why psychedelics are important right now is because they, so for example, I was just in Prague. Prague is, I think, we've been voted the most atheist country in uh, Europe. They're not happy about that designation, by the way. It's not like aid, but, but, uh, but they're really struggling with psychedelics because they're taking off. Because remember I said something? Wisdom is not optional. People will pursue, not even people. As soon as you get in highly intelligent social beings, they pursue altered states of consciousness because transcendence is an integral way in which you become wiser. So Caledonian crows will roll, will tumble down rooftops so they get dizzy. And Caledonian crows are really smart, right? And elephants will eat fruit that's fermenting so they get stoned, which is dangerous, but still it's worth it to them. Okay, so the transcendence matters, but the thing is, the thing about psychedelics is, you know, the, the old thing, Timothy Leary, you need the set and the setting, but I would add a third S, you need the sacredness. It has to be put in a context that properly integrates that transcendence into multiple, multiple domains of your life. See, what religions used to do is, um, so for example, you, you can get into the flow state while playing a video game, but for many people that doesn't transfer outside to their, their life. And in fact, you can get video game addiction, which is you're flowing in the game, but you're, you're, you're getting anti-flow in your life. Anti-flow is depression, by the way. Flow and depression are anti-correlated. Anti right? And so you're depressed there, you're flowing here, so you get more and more, you just try and spend more and more time inside the video game. Right? When I was doing Tai Chi Chuan, I'd been doing it for, for about four years, and I was in graduate school in, in time long, long ago. Right? Um, and people were coming up to me and saying, what's up with you? You're now much more balanced in your arguments, you're much more flowing, you're much, and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't notice it. But what was happening in the ritual, and that's the proper way of talking about it, because this is what a ritual does. It sets things up so it transfers to many domains of your life, and it percolates from different levels of your psyche. This is what we have to offer people if we want to answer your question about how do we get it going? How do we set up the proper framing, the ritual framing, and the philosophical framing, because that's what Taoism did, that's what Buddhism did, that's what Christianity did, such that when people are undergoing the transformative experience, it regularly and reliably transfers broadly and deeply into their life and deeply and transformatively into their psyche. When we put that context around transformative context, that's how we can, I think, start to generate the religion that's not a religion without anybody trying to found a religion. And in connection with that, I think we have to listen to Thich Nhat Hanh. The next Buddha is the Sangha. Stop looking for the individual. The thing that's going to act like Socrates or Siddhartha to us is rituals that activate the collective intelligence of distributed cognition so that we transformatively experience it in a way that transfers broadly in our life and deeply in our psyche. That's what we need to do. So in, an, in addition to any ecology of practices, we need a meta-dialogical practice that is doing that so that we have the sage to guide us without investing that dangerous power in any particular personality. That's my proposal. I'm in. Um, no, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so 
So I really want to open up for Q and A in a moment because the, the the value of being all here together is that we we have that, and that includes online as well. But I thought maybe we could just close this this opening with with just continuing on that track. I'm I'm curious where to do that, right? To start doing that, and to start coming together in that way where we are focusing on our collective intelligence and on the sangha. What capacities do we need as individuals and or as groups? I, I think we need the capacities that are being practiced in an ecology practices. Um, Maybe define the, what oh, yeah, that okay. as well. Okay, so the, first of all, the, the point is you are, your, ad, your adaptivity relies on what's called a point of processing. Let me just give you a couple of quick examples that you're experiencing right now. So it's not like, what's John talking about? He always uses these multi-syllabic words. What's wrong with him? I get it, I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you have to constantly calibrate your level of arousal. I don't mean sexual arousal. Hopefully that's not being activated right now. Right? I mean your metabolic arousal. And so, there, there's no, there's, what, what you have is you have your peripheral nervous system. You're autonomic. Listen to that word. That means self-law, self-organizing, self-governing. There's no boss. There's, there's two systems, the parasympathetic system and the sympathetic system, and they work, and it works in this way. The sympathetic system is biased to try and interpret the much, uh, much of the world as it can as an, a threat or an opportunity, and therefore to raise your level of arousal. It's biased. The parasympathetic system is bi biased the other way. It's biased to try and interpreting as much of the world as safe so that you can rest, recuperate. And then they're not separate from each other. Like this. They're constantly pulling on each other, trying to correct each other. The biases continually play off against each other so that you are constantly evolving your level of arousal. Because if I was like this, that's not good, right? It's like, okay, so I'll talk to you. That's not good. And being Canadian, I'll just be middle all the time. That's not good either, okay? It constantly has to evolve. It does so in a self-organizing, self-governing manner. That's a point of processing. Your attention is doing it right now. Just so think about arousal and attention and how much they matter to sense making. You have two networks, well, you have three, but I'm just going to talk about two right now. You have one, the task focus network, and it's trying to keep you focused on the task, hopefully paying attention to John Verveke right now. You have the default mode network that is trying to get, let your mind wander. You know, you know how much you spend doing that every day. You ever wondered why you wander? It's adaptive. These two processes are an opponent process. So you focus, then your mind wanders and creates all kinds of possibilities of what you could pay attention to. And you kill most of them off. It's like evolution. You kill most of those variations off and you bring a couple in, put it into the task focused and you focus again. Variation, selection, variation, selection. That's how you evolve your attention. It's constantly evolving. That's a point of processing. Does that make sense? Okay, those are just two easily accessible examples of something that is multi-scale throughout all of your biology and your cognition. That's what I mean about how dynamically self-organizing it is. There is no panacea practice because you work through opponent processing. Well, meditation. Med Remember what I said? Is this enough? If, all, if that's all you do, it's better than nothing. You know, it's, what about if I just never take my glasses off and look into the world deeply? Ah, then I don't know if I'm looking through rose-colored glasses. What do I need to do? I need to do opponent processing. I need to cycle between them continuously. A meditative practice and a contemplative practice. I have to break out of inappropriate frames and explore for new frames that I don't yet know. And they have to, I have to do that. Same thing with, should I do just a seated practice? You should do seated practice and a movement practice. 
You should do practices that shut off the inferential mind to enhance insight. Those are mindfulness practices. And you should do practices that do the opposite. Oh no, I don't want to shut off my insight processing. That's the sure path to glory. When you like it, you call it insight. When you don't like that process, you call it jumping to a conclusion. It's the same process. It's the same process. Oh, my intuition. When your intuition is working, you like it. When you don't like it, you call it bias or racism. There's no panacea process. Stop looking for the divine faculty. You don't have one. Stop demonizing any of your faculties. They're all there for an adaptive reason. So you need complex systems of practices that are in complementary relationships, opponent processing relationships, to get the most dynamically self-organizing process to best fit your dynamically self-organizing cognition that runs on multi-layered opponent processing. That's why you need an ecology of practices. Done. Did that answer that question? Absolutely, yeah, amazing, thank you. Thanks, Tom. So, I would like to have some time for Q&A. Hi, John, thank you very much. I wanted to say that the word crisis is very negative. Yes. And I feel like when we look, or history looks back in 100 years, there will be some kind of name for this period, some ism. And I feel like we should just go ahead and create that name and make it positive and not keep talking about this negative crisis. Sure. And I would like to ask you uh, to try to do this. Maybe not on stage right now, but. Well, I, I, I'm hoping, again, repeating the shameless plug, I, I, the, the, the after Socrates is not negative. It's constructive. It's creative. It's right. And I'm, I'm actually talking with people about what is it that's being positively proposed uh, that, and I don't have a name. We're, we're, we're doing kind of the same thing that Ali's doing. We're bandying names around right now, but I do think something is going to come out of it. Um, that's all I can say right now. Okay, John, we have a question from online, and this comes from... Uh... Burton Anderson, if we have an ecology of practices to develop insight, that is seeing the glasses, the framing, meditation, contemplation, the four P's, that is propositional, procedural, perspectival, and participatory, are we not leaving out the heart? Where in all of this does the heart come in? Being a giver, taking care, cultivating love. It seems to me that sometimes the West misses this key piece from the East. Is that not the case? If not, where is it addressed? Uh, great question. So first of all, I want to remind uh, what I said a, a few minutes ago. Relevance realization is not cold calculation. It's caring. It's caring. It's caring about this information rather than that. And the reason why you care about inf computers don't care about the information they're processing. They don't. You do. And you care about the information you're processing because you are constantly, moment by moment, taking care of yourself. You are a self-making thing, autopoetic. Right? So affect, arousal, and attention are intrinsically part of your attention, of your relevance realization, of your intelligence. The division between head and heart, and in Buddhism, you, you have a word that corresponds to both. That division is relatively recent and artificial in the West. It comes after Descartes and with the rise of Romanticism. And so, you, and we are all infected with decadent Cartesianism and decadent Romanticism. We walk around graphing the world and then watching romantic comedies. And both of those really mislead us into how reality operates. I think the second is more evil, but we can talk about that another time. Yeah. So I have argued that agape and philia philosophy, philia sophia, 
which are forms of love. I would also include Eros, but I'll talk about Philea and Agape. As we start talking about Eros, somebody will clip this and we'll get it on the, the net. And look, John's a pervert. Okay. Um, Philea, I think a romantic relationship, even that we call it romantic relationships, means the romantics won. Romantic love isn't romantic. Imagine if it was, the world would be insane. Philea, Philea Sophia, if we cannot, when we do dialogical practices, when, we, when, when Guy and Chris and I do dialectic into dialogus and the practices, people will often say, I, I, I found a kind of intimacy I didn't know existed. That caring connectedness. It's not, it's not sexual. It's not, I didn't make, that person's not my friend. They're not part of my family. It's fellowship. It's philia. And then the, the task is you create philia, which is fellowship love, and then you direct that towards Sophia, wisdom. It's absolutely central. Dialectic to dialogos is you're learning how to cultivate philia, how to cultivate Sophia, and have philia directed onto Sophia. So philia is central to the cultivation of wisdom. Agape. Spinoza knew this. Plato knew this. Knew this. Spinoza. You read Spinoza, it's like reading a math textbook. Axiom. Proposition. Proof. Theorem. So, uh, you read it and you read it and you read it. But what does Spinoza actually argue? He actually argues that the blessed life comes from love, not reason. Because reason can't break free from egocentrism on its own. Iris Murdoch, to love something is to acknowledge that something other than yourself is real. That is what all of rationality is ultimately for, but it ultimately is empowered by love, caring about the right thing in the right way. Yes, yeah, Socrates claimed that he knew that he did not know, but he claimed to know ta erotica. He claimed to know how to love. He would walk into the marketplace and say, look at all the things I don't need. He knew how to care. This is absolutely central, but we've got to give up. We've got to give up that reason and emotion are separate from each other. They're not. Damasio, Descartes' error. Think of the name of the book, by the way. Descartes' error. You get people with brain damage, so their frontal lobes are disconnected from the more emotional centers of the brain. The idea, by the way, that things are located, here's a Verveke prediction. That idea, this part of the brain does this, this part of it, it's going to be gone in 10 or 15 years in cognitive science. That's like phrenology, it's cartography that doesn't actually apply to how the brain works. Nevertheless, these people have a kind of damage such that they're a bit, they, you can give them an IQ test and they can fly at it, they can do really well. But they don't care in the right way. So you can destroy them by saying, before you write the test, before you write the test, you want to write it in red ink or blue ink. And then they try to calculate all the possibilities. All the possibilities they get overwhelmed. We have to, have to stop this notion that affect and intelligence are separate from each other. Aristotle said it best. He said, look, it's not about being angry or not. It's about knowing how and when to be angry at the right time, for the right reason, to the right degree. Cool. So there are these sort of um, different phases that we went through on Rebel Wisdom and also different kind of big themes. And I often think of them as, as kind of, sometimes I struggle whether to start small and zoom out or do it the other way around. But one of those, so, you know, Daniel later, Daniel Schmackenberger will be speaking to the meta crisis, um, the, the sort of 
many overlapping crises and issues we face as a species. That's like the really big picture. Um, and also what John was just sharing around the meaning crisis around, uh, you know, how, how we find meaning or, or don't and how we actually show up with each other and culturally, that's also quite a, a kind of big picture thing. I, you know, you could perhaps argue that it sits within the wider meta crisis, the meaning crisis. So that's at least certainly a way I've conceptualized it. And then we have what we're actually living through in day to day life on social media in conversations with our friends, in conversations at work, which has been a huge part of what we've covered as well on Rebel Wisdom, which is the culture wars, right? The, and it's really, um, the reason I sometimes uh, struggle to figure out, you know, whether to start big and zoom in smaller, go the other way around, is because there's something about when we actually engage with these issues, it's real and we feel it and it's visceral and it matters because it could actually come up in conversation tomorrow with your friend or your partner or at work, unlikely that the meta crisis is going to, but possible, depends where you work. But, um, you know, things that are really so big and complex are often harder to grasp. And sometimes we can see the general in the particular. And perhaps more than more than most people we've had on Rebelism, I think Aisha, I can be sitting here, um, has this incredible ability to approach these questions of what's going on in the culture wars with a level of curiosity and empathy, which is basically what we've been trying our best to model and often failing, to be honest, sometimes it's really difficult to talk about these topics. I've always been really struck by Aisha's ability to do that and, and to really be in a, in a space of inquiry and curiosity around what are really complex topics and often topics that we don't feel safe to discuss. In, in culture. Um, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of being uh, a person uh, in 2022 and online and dealing with all the complex cultural dynamics that we all have to deal with. It's interesting that John mentioned before that any religion that can't incorporate social media into it won't work. I don't think I've ever heard that idea. And I, I was just really, I, I felt an audible ah in the room when he said that. And I think it's, uh, really important. So Aisha, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I just wanted to hear it again. Yeah. Um, so I thought, so you are in the midst of writing a book yes. called The Awakening. Indeed. Yes. And I know from having just finished that process that um, the process itself changed my mind, right? There was a process of really wrestling with ideas. Can you tell us a little bit, what is the book about and what have you learned writing it so far? Yeah, so um, The Awakening is actually about how, it's about my journey into, I guess, the culture wars and how I found myself in a position uh, where I was talking about these things that are quite explosive um, in public, which is not what I generally have done. I'm a fashion stylist. That's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. So I'm swerving all the way out of my lane. Um, and it's a, the book is a journey about why that began. And for me, I, you know, it's interesting that we were, were talking about psychedelics earlier, which I haven't actually tried myself. But in 2013, 2014, I had a very naturally induced psychedelic experience that lasted about three to six months. Uh, time was very hard to uh, grasp, you know, at that point. So it could have been potentially shorter or potentially longer, but it felt like it lasted for about three to six months. And this happened, it was instigated after the death of my brother, which was very sudden. Um, and I remember the only thing that I remember happening before this world opened up to me um, is I remember having a night to myself, you know, a few months after he died, where I was thinking about, or it wasn't that I was thinking, I, I was trying to get to sleep. And all of a sudden, like a slideshow of every question I never wanted to answer just kind of came to me. It was like being cornered in a lift with someone that you hate. Um, and all of these sort of questions about 
why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, why am I working as a fashion stylist? What does fashion mean to me? What does status mean to me? Um, what is the attraction towards brands? My friends, you know, um, are we friends or are these people habits in some ways that, you know, that I've just kind of grown a connection to simply because we know each other, but how much do we really have in common? Um, I was asking myself all sorts of questions that I wouldn't usually ask. And I remember the person that I met on the other side of these questions was someone that I didn't recognize. Uh, and I recognized that I was a lot more gray um, and, and messy than I, I ever would have maybe um, acknowledged before. Um, and after that day, my life completely changed. Uh, I went through three to six months of absolute bliss and euphoria and everyone was wonderful and beautiful and everyone looked suspiciously good. Um, and it was a really incredible time. I spoke to everyone and I don't know, felt a deep connection uh, with everyone and everything around me. Um, you know, I remember during this time, really weird things, you know, I was very much an environmental Philistine, you know, I, I knew nothing uh, or cared not much for nature. And all of a sudden I was you know, passing trees and weeping, you know, it was a really odd experience. And, and then just like any high, um, there is a come down. Um, and my come down was, you know, lasted much longer um, than the initial kind of euphoric stage. Um, and in that time I was seeking, I was trying to work out or it suddenly dawned on me that this really beautiful magical experience that I had could have potentially just been psychosis, mental illness. Um, and, but you know, there was always something that, that stayed with me that didn't allow me to jump to that conclusion too easily. And so I was seeking um, and I was you know, trying to, I didn't realize at the time because I didn't speak in, in the way that I might speak now, the same vocabulary and language wasn't in regular use for me. But I, I think I was seeking wisdom. Uh, so it's, it's funny again that, that John mentioned that, but I was seeking it in all of the places that I don't think it lives. Um, and that's what kind of brought me into activism for a long while. Um, I was, you know, I, I can't say that I was a, an activist in the way that we might understand that word, but you know, I was at protests and I was meeting people and I was talking to people and interested in conversations around race, around gender, a lot of the, the hot button issues that are still very thorny to talk about. Um, and I recognized quite soon that whatever it was that I was looking for in those people, in those groups, yeah, it, it wasn't there. Um, and actually I found that the ways that we are thinking around a lot of these topics and the ways that we are encouraged to look at one another um, was actually quite detrimental. I knew that there was a chance that I could have had a, a psychotic break. Um, and I didn't want to go to um, a therapist at the time. I was sure that if I kind of explained to the average therapist that I, you know, went through this amazing psychedelic trip and I, I had all of these new powers or it felt like I had new powers. And, you know, I was meeting all of these guides along the way that, you know, there's a good chance of, of what I might be told. And I wanted to, I wanted to really explore whatever this was uh, for myself. And, that's when I, I guess I started to recognize um, a lot of what was contributing to the, the, the very prolonged state of depression that I had after that trip. Um, and I, yeah, and I just recognized that a lot of the ways we're encouraged to think around many of these topics are exacerbating that. And, and so the book is about, um, it looks at social media, you know, it's my awakening to maybe what we've often called wokeness, um, waking up from it and realizing that um, complexity is, you know, is, is a beautiful thing. And when you embrace it, I've never thought of myself as empathetic. And, and so whenever people, you know, say to me that you, you display quite a lot of empathy, I've always been somewhat taken aback by that because I, I don't think that's what I was trying to do, but I think when you embrace complexity, you reliably get there. You know, I think that's where, that's the end point. I think you just, you know, it's, it's somewhat you know, automatic. It's part of that process. 
Um, and so the book is, you know, encouraging us to think um, more, I guess, you know, empathetically around some of these topics um, and about the ways that, uh, you know, the, the current state of activism is kind of um, making us, um, keeping us distressed. Yeah, thank you. That's a really lovely summary. Um, it, it makes me, yeah, I'm feeling, uh, I'm, I'm curious right now. I'm remembering back to the early events that we did where we would, at Rebel Wisdom, which would be down the road in um, Rick Lane. Uh, and very often we would have a topic and we would have people come to discuss the topic. It might be a little bit, you know, might be around gender or whatever. It might be something alive in the culture. And the overwhelming energy, there were two things I really noticed. One was always, um, oh my God, it's so good to talk about this freely. And it's just like this kind of cathartic release. And then the second thing was always, I have no idea how to talk about this, right? Because it is really hard. And, and over and over, we had, in fact did a whole course with Sarah Ness and Geoff Crum called The Art of Difficult Conversations, because so many of us have no idea how to approach a topic like race or gender in a nuanced, complex way. You're really good at it. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is needed? What are some of the things that really help us have those conversations? Well, I, I don't go into any conversation, you know, assuming someone's intent. You know, I'm, I'm curious about people and wherever their political perspectives uh, or wherever, wherever their political loyalties, wherever they may lie, is, is not really relevant to me. I'm much more interested in why people think the way that they do, um, regardless of whatever the thought is. And I think if you approach conversations with that in mind, why do you think the way that you do? What led you here? Uh, what is your backstory? I think, you know, after my brother died and I had this um, euphoric experience, and then even the one after, you become extremely hyper aware of death. Um, and I think, you know, I'm still like that. And I think having death in mind very much has always made me want to know everyone, know everyone quite deeply and to, you know, to, to think of intimacy beyond um, the romantic sphere. Um, and so I'm interested in people. I guess I'm just genuinely interested in people. Um, and so that's probably why, um, I don't know, I don't assume that people are are trying to be evil. I think most people tend to think that their ideas are good, you know, uh, rather than seeing the world as like a battle between good and evil. I think it's often, you know, competing ideas of what people believe to be goodness. Um, and when I think of it that way, that somewhere in this idea that I may find noxious, someone sees something good. Uh, and I'm interested to see what that is, whether I agree or not. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways, but also I think in terms of gender and race, I guess it's because, you know, I'm, uh, I think about, I think about um, the ways that I have been influenced before. I think about the times when I've had very, um, should I say, a combative way of approaching things and why, you know, when I was a lot more, you know, binary in my thinking, what was contributing to that. Um, I guess it's through my own self exploration and kind of always being somewhat aware of um, the muck within. Um, it, it doesn't really allow me to kind of, um, I don't know, approach anyone with a certain type of hostility. I, I mean, uh, I guess I'm just very aware of my own dirt, you know, and I think when you are aware of it, it's, it's much harder to kind of make these broad strokes about what other people are. Um, and I'm really interested in, I don't know, maybe alleviating or helping other people or reducing some of the, the issues that we see in society. And I, I think you can only do that when you're prepared to listen uh, with a calm temperament, when you are less inclined to make other people know how good you are um, it, in, by condemning someone for how bad they are. I think it just you know, entirely changes the approach. So um, I guess it's curiosity, you know, maybe that's a really long way of saying, you know, it's curiosity and, and not thinking of people in binary terms and remembering that, you know, I see lots of myself in everyone that I meet, you know, regardless of their financial bracket, their age, their um, 
status you know religion i i always see elements of myself in people and i guess also when that's there it's it's very hard to i don't know just um demean people just because it brings retweets yeah, beautifully said um there's this really i think fascinating thread that i want to pick up on it's something that we talked about in advance of the event because when i called you you were working on a particular chapter in the book and and it's come through here as well which is this this link between so we have a mental health crisis in the west and, and beyond i would say um and then we also have a culture war happening at the same time and i think it's very interesting to look at where those two things intersect um and we talked a little bit about it but I, i'm curious to to just kind of explore that a little bit like where where do they intersect do you, do you see like what what's kind of the relationship between our, our mental health and how we're showing up collectively in in you know in the culture wars yeah i, I mean i i don't think it's coincidental that you know at the time that many people describe the world as feeling more mad than usual that we are also seeing many more people uh, open about their mental health struggles um and you know even for me when i was going through the worst of this come down um what was important to me was finding community and when you're in a very vulnerable state um this is when you are prime uh, to be swept up in movements uh, groups that don't necessarily have your best interest and you know it isn't surprising to me that we have a mental health crisis when so many things that are um, corrosive for your mental health are in many ways encouraged. You know, we're encouraged to think in quite binary terms. Uh, we do that, that's how we kind of signal um, loyalty to our tribes. Um, that's how we, you know, you can't, you have to see someone as a monster if you want a justification to fight them. So you're not, then, so it then doesn't make sense to kind of see the nuances and the gray in this person, uh, because then the whole reason your your sense of purpose is taken away. Uh, but not only that, we know there is a big currency in in victimhood um, that I don't think has ever been there before. Um, I think we're a lot more. I think a lot of people, you know, in my uh, opinion, overuse the term um, narcissistic. But I definitely do think that we are self-obsessed um, to a really unhealthy point and i think you know every time that i've explored what's going on with me when i felt the worst i can often kind of find lots of threads of just obsessing about myself obsessing about what i think other people think of me obsessing about the weight of what will happen if i say this or you know it's just a complete you know self-absolved spiral and when we're encouraged always to think about how this thing affects me and my group um, and your identity, there is such a fixation on one's identity um, that I think, yeah, it's a it's a recipe for yeah mental distress. And so you know you often see the people most vocal about. Um, their mental health struggles often are activists you know a lot of the mental health awareness that has kind of come through in the last few years has been from many younger generations and it has come through people who you know the be kind lobby as you know some people might refer to them um who don't necessarily display this to other people um so um i think the ways that your seen as a reliable safe person and an ally and all of these types of things i think a lot of those ways of being yeah uh, cause mental distress so that's how i think they intersect and and as i said you know when you're when you're in the thick of it you're often searching for community you're searching for meaning you're searching for a way to make your life yeah mean something you know what is going to be my legacy and i want to be a good person and i've been told that being a good person looks like this and often the way it looks is being perpetually angry, you know, being outraged, um, condemning this entire group of people. So you instinctively are going to feel, you know, threatened wherever you go. Um, and so I think for me, yeah, when I saw the ways that this was really bad to many of the people that I care about, and I felt like if you wanted to help groups that are 
you know, described as vulnerable, um, teaching this really um, self-sabotaging way of going about things is, is not the way to do it. And I, I couldn't unsee that. And I, yeah, I, I wanted to say something. Um, I want to talk a bit about, and, and then open up for q and I want to talk a bit about social media. Um, and I'm curious, one aspect of this question is what you make of uh, Elon Musk's Twitter takeover, how are you feeling about it? Um, and then also just more generally, you know, uh, how much, of, and this is, this is something I hear so many different answers to and I swing back and forth, how much of the polarization and culture wars would you lay at the feet of social media and the way the platforms are designed and how much of it do you believe is us? You know, this is a, a complex thing. Maybe, um, maybe we'll start with there and then we'll get on to Elon yeah, Musk. Um, I, I put a lot of it, you know, at, at, the, at the foot of social media. Um, I think this is where many people have kind of um, developed the idea that the, the way to be a good person is for one solely calling out bad people or is to be some kind of activist or is to feel threatened by this group or that group i think it's where we've learned that there is um that the status is conferred on us when we present ourselves sufficiently as victims um i think yeah a lot has been encouraged there i mean i don't think any of us were meant to know what so many people were thinking um, at all. And I, I don't think we're equipped to deal with that. I'm certainly not equipped to deal with that. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, even when I was most active on Twitter, I never searched my timeline. Like that feels really masochistic to me. Um, just because, you know, there's just so much there and, and, and so little time to process it. it. It feels like, I don't know, like junk food, like by you know, injecting it into my brain. Um, and so, but I think when you are in the habit of doing that every day, and the only way that you can kind of prove to people who can't see your actions that you are a good person is by what you believe, um, I, I certainly think that um, it, you know, a lot of the onus I think is on social media for the ways that the culture wars have manifested. Um, so yeah, I, I think yeah, it has um, a lot to do with it. In terms of Elon Musk, I. I found other people's reception to that to be really interesting. You know, I see on, on the one side, you have lots of people like, you know, yay for free speech, like, this is going to be great, we can say whatever we want, um, and things like that. And you know, you have other people who, you know, feel very cautious of this move and feel like it's going to be really dangerous. I certainly don't see Elon Musk as any savior. And I don't think that he can fix the issues that are going on there. I mean, because even if you can say whatever you want on social media, um, the problem is that we're now living in a world where what you say on social media can get you fired from your job and it doesn't have to be hateful, it just has to be unpopular. Um, and so I'd much rather keep my job than a social media account. Um, so I would, I don't know, for me, being able to say what you want on Twitter, no matter how controversial, but still having to pay the penalty um, in your real life because, you know, there is a, a dominant ideology of how one should be or one should think and say on certain issues. Um, doesn't seem like a real win to me. Um, I don't use Twitter that much at the moment, um, mostly because I have been working on the book, uh, but also because, you know, I think anyone who follows any public figure for long enough, you know, it doesn't happen to a few people, but to most people, you see a certain decline you know, in their character, in the way that they speak, you know, the wisest, or maybe not wise, but very intellectual people who pride themselves on their sophistic sophistication, um, you know, just descend into these adolescents. Um, and it's really, um, I don't know, I, I learn a lot from that, you know, and I think for me, that's a, a reason at the moment why I'm kind of staying off and thinking about what is driving this behavior. Um, so yeah, I do think, you know, once again, yeah, social media does play a large part in our sort of collective neuroses. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what the percentage is, but um, yeah, it's, it seems to be significant. Um, yeah, there's a really nice concept called value capture from a, a philosopher called 
I can never pronounce his last name, but he's so good. I always want to reference him. But it's uh, C T Nguyen. Uh, yeah. So, but it's worth checking out. There's a book called The Art of Games, and his argument is Twitter is a game, basically, it is, right? Yeah, it made it you you win by getting retweets and likes, exactly. but games capture your values. So the games has its own value, and then you might have your own value, which is I want to have a really beautiful generative conversation full of love. And Twitter's like, well, that's not the game. And our values aren't that. So you have a choice. Don't play the game, play a different game, or play our game. And that makes a lot of sense where you see this decline of value capture. Happens in institutions as well. You, you go into perhaps a charity with the best intentions, and then slowly the, the, the values get captured. And I think it's a, a huge um, aspect of the times we're living in. Just la last question before we open up for Q&A. Um, what, what are you most hopeful for in, in terms of our collective conversation and the culture wars? Like, do you see things shifting? Do you see things moving? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we might be, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not confident in this just because, you know, I, I'm not looking at social media so much anymore, but I am, you know, still getting lots of emails from people who, you know, on one hand do say that, you know, you know, I'm glad I found you because, you know, I don't feel like I can have these conversations. But then I also encounter a lot of people who do feel like the tide is shifting a bit and you can, you know, address things in potentially more nuanced ways without, you know, being called a Nazi. Um, and so I think that's progress for a lot of people. Um, and so I think there is, you know, especially let's say around gender, uh, there does seem to be, you know, the more people kind of come out and talk about negative experiences or where they were mentally when they made certain decisions, um, I think there is some leeway around there. Um, but I'm hopeful for more things like this. I'm, I'm hopeful for um, us getting much more wiser to the fact that you know, social media is is corrosive to us in many ways. I mean, we know it and we say it and it's a meme and it's trite at that point. But like knowing something isn't really kind of really deeping in, you know, and I, I don't think that's what we're doing with social media. So I'm hoping that um, generations that are coming up will kind of look at this as a really, you know, boring use of one's time. You know, and you know, there's much better things to do in the world than kind of um, putting yourself in this position where you're terrified of everything and you're seeing everyone in these really sort of um, noxious ways and just paranoid. I, I'd like to think that this is going to be um, a blip, you know, fair enough, it's been quite a long one. Um, but where, yeah, this seems, you know, doing things like that um, seems uh, as childish as it really is. You know, I hope that happens. So thank you, Aisha. Great, we've got time before lunch for a few questions for Q&A. So yes, gentleman over here, raise his hand. And Kevin, have you got a mic? Yeah. And again, online, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll take an online question as well. Uh, this guy over here. Hiya. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've just come out of three years of a, a drama school, which had quite a ideolo ideological bias on, on what kind of um, conversations and type of, on how I could speak and how I could. Um, and thankfully, I think I, over the three years, I managed to navigate it with, with love in a, in, a, in a decent way, but I still feel a certain kind of mixture of resentment and fear um, around when certain conversations, um, certain catchphrases pop up. And, and then I get a, either a, a certain, when I'm engaging with a person who I, that, 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 that archetype pops up and I see that um, the archetype of wokeness or whatever. Um, I either disengage, switch off, or I kind of like, I, I, I serve to it. I don't, I, I find it difficult to engage with that person with that curiosity and, and complexity that um, I would like to still. Um, because I, I, I fear I don't trust myself. I'll, I'll, it, it, we'll start fighting and I, I don't want to do that. Um, and I don't trust myself to enter that, that, that trusting space of listening compassionately. 
Um, and I wonder if you have any advice for how you can let go of that and, 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 and meet people with more with compassion. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. It is certainly something I feel at times. You know, I think it is quite natural to feel a certain resentment when, you know, you're having to self-edit and self-censor so much. You feel like you're not being true to yourself. And if you're not being true to yourself, sometimes it's very hard to like yourself. Um, and so I, I, I do get that. But you know, in my case, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been there, but with my case, I always have to remember that, you know, maybe not to the same degree, or at least maybe that's what I tell myself, but I've been there, you know, I've, and, and I think if you think back to a time where you've had ideas that you now look back on that embarrass you, uh, and that you can't believe you thought that, and you felt it, and you thought it with so much conviction, um, if you think back to where you were at that time, and what was driving a lot of that conviction, even though it was very deceptive. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a lot easier to see your past self in them. Um, I tend to, when I'm talking to someone that has that archetype, um, I don't often say what I think as much, but I do find myself just asking questions gently, not to kind of do a gotcha. Um, but I think if I'm, you know, people like to talk about themselves, you know, and people like to think that they're interesting. And so I think if you come to someone and have made them feel that way, by the time I think you, if you do feel compelled to and share some of your perspective, um, I don't think it necessarily has to go down as um, explosively as it might have otherwise. Um, and it's always about your language. You know, I often make sure when I'm talking to people, because now there's so many kind of buzzwords and catchphrases that as soon as you use it, people think they've worked out everything about you. So, you know, if you use the word virtue signaling, some people will just assume that you're a conservative, you know, or if you even use the word woke, you know, then people will assume that. Um, but often, you know, just I disagree is something that I think very much kind of can get people's backs up. And so generally, I don't often use that word when I'm talking to someone I'm just like oh that's interesting because I see it like this as opposed to I disagree with that you know because someone's generally already on the on the defensive and so I'm, I'm very careful with the language that I use and make sure that I've given them enough space to um, to share whatever it is they feel um, without being yeah without being defensive um, but I think more so than anything, it's just remembering, you know, I've been there in some way, shape or form. And in many ways, I think it is a youthful rite of passage. Um, the problem now, I think, is that it's extended beyond youth for many people, you know, and it's become quite dominant uh, amongst, you know, people teaching the youth. Um, and that is unsettling to me. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, remembering that people are seeking meaning and reasons for the way of why their lives are the way that they are. Um, and I think, you know, whenever I'm in my worst moment, you know, I can sometimes see the impulse to want to, oh, it's because of this, it's because of that, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I, keeping that in mind generally helps me. I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but yeah, that's what I think. Is it? Good answer. Thank you. <clears throat> you uh, we're going to take... Uh, one from online. You just gave me a horrible flashback to my Ayn Rand days when I was 19 as well. You know, there's some emba embarrassing ideas. Um, yeah, no, but it is really, yeah, that's a really lovely advice, I think. Um, so, moving swiftly on, uh, we're going to hear from someone online, yeah? That's right. We've got a question from Helen Santos. Uh, wave your hand, Helen, up there on the board. Hey, there Helen. You go. Uh, would it even be appropriate to feel an interest in the opposite point of view when in the face of outrageous actions like abusive relationships, pedophilia, mur murder, et cetera, boy, these are really, these are the big ones. How that affects our notion of right and wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So um, is Helen asking, you know, is it, is it a good idea to have curiosity about everyone, especially people who commit the most atrocious acts? The most heinous. Yeah. She is not. An 
we, I think so, actually. I think, you know, when my, I, I mentioned that my, my brother died, um, but maybe what I didn't say is that he was murdered. And, and that is actually where this curiosity began. I think the only way that I felt that I could cope with that situation without hating everyone, uh, which is, um, which only affects me, you know, was to try and figure out, you know, and, and you know, I'll never know, but at least to speculate, to be curious and to be imaginative about the kinds of thinking situations that lead someone to that point of view where doing something like that seems worthwhile. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, from thinking about his motives, where he was, his age, peer pressure, self-deception, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to, you know, go out with this young man who did this for coffee, but it does mean that I don't allow him to kind of take two lives because, you know, I could still be here um, and not really living at all if I was to let the weight of what that incident did, you know, completely um, drown me. So yeah, it is actually from thinking about a murderer um, uh, where I, I learned the value of curiosity in, you know, in, in being a shield a against fear. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you for that. Got time for one last question before we go for lunch. We've got about five minutes left. And so you've got your, uh, maybe this lady here. Hi. Um, I am struck often by the fact that many groups who we would typically associate with the woke, woke movement often seem like to me that they're processing a lot of pain and then projecting that outwards in ways that aren't productive. Uh, so I was curious as to whether you've seen effective ways that groups can process and move through that in a more healthy way that then allows for connection. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a hard one because, you know, it's the kind of person that we're talking about or that archetype that, you know, many of us may associate with the woke movement, you know, who's generally the type of person who will tell everyone else to seek therapy, seek help, you know, and so, you know, a lot of them are in therapy, you know, a lot of them are kind of are in spaces where they are processing this type of thing, or not maybe not processing, but at least talking about it. So, you know, I don't see it as just something professional at this stage, or something that, you know, an external professional kind of person may be able to help them with. I, I think, you know, the biggest shift in my life um, has kind of come through exploring my own propensity towards self-deception, you know, um, because that's, I think I started thinking about self-deception around the time that my brother died because I recognized that this person who did it must have told themselves a story, you know, a, a convincing story that made this okay. And so I think a lot of what I share online and write about is trying to get us more comfortable uh, with recognizing that we deceive ourselves in lots of different ways and that we do this um, to our own detriment and, and peril sometimes. Um, and I think if we can, or at least maybe all I can say is what I try to do, because you know, as much as some people would say that I say or talk about controversial issues or say controversial things, you know, I don't get much pushback or I don't get people, you know, um, slandering me very much. Um, and I think, you know, that is because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily, or at least I hope I'm not coming across like I'm, I'm talking from the ivory tower, you know, I'm talking from, you know, a lot of the time, someone who is also going through many of these distressing moments, but I'm just trying to figure out a different way of how to deal with it. Um, so I don't know, I think this is not maybe the clearest answer, but I think we need to get comfortable knowing that um, sometimes we are the architects of our own pain. And that doesn't make us a bad person because we've kind of adopted bad thinking styles because you know it could have come from, you know, or the influence of that could have come from many different places. But I think as long as people are always looking out there for the answer, um, I think 
yeah, I, I think you end up staying in that state for a lot longer. Um, but then also at the same time, it's hard because there's a maybe a thin line between like self exploration and just you know, self obsession. Um, and you know how you walk that line um, is is a, is a difficult one. But again, I, I think I'll just maybe settle on. I think if we get comfortable, you know, knowing because I, I think that's what I don't see. I think every time I often see this type of archetype, you know, talking about their suffering, it's always kind of you know been imposed on them by some external force. Um, but maybe it's the way that we should start thinking about our suffering. I often do think that suffering can be it has in my life at least it's been you know a great catalyst um for change positive change and i think uh, an idea that needs to be introduced into the mainstream more is um what psychologists call post-traumatic growth you know because we hear a lot about um uh, ptsd and, and things like that but i i post-traumatic growth is maybe what some people might think of as a spiritual awakening or some life changing at a moment and i'm interested in how we can get to that place because I do think that place is maybe available to more of us than we think if not all I'd like to believe is on the other side of our mental maladies but as long as we don't allow the mind viruses to seep in um, completely at least you know I think that's waiting for people so yeah there, there is another side to all of this yeah amazing Look at that, the timing of the battery running out on the tablet is just perfect. Aisha, thank you so much. Thank that was you. absolutely excellent. That was really a pleasure. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, so my prompt for you guys is, I mean, I think one of the things that's exciting about this conversation is that it's, well, it's meta crisis meets meaning crisis in some ways. That's, that's. Uh, Sounds like a horror movie. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, but I, I, I'd like to just start with asking you, just initially, where do you each individually see those two concepts intersecting, the meta crisis and the meaning crisis? Where do they speak to each other? Where do they overlap? Um, so I've been asked that question a, a few times. Um, and um, for me, part of the answer is this. Um, I think the meaning crisis is an important instance of scarcity mentality. So when human beings lack a particularly important resource, it has very comprehensive effects on their cognition. They become very short term. They become inflexible in their thinking. Their insight capacity goes down. Um, this is very reliable. And it doesn't have to be for food because people will actually give up food for meaning. That tells you how important meaning is. So when there's a meaning scarcity, um, what it tends to do is really significantly limit the cognitive and affective resources we can bring to bear on the metacrisis. So I think one of the things that I'm interested in is that direction, that the meaning crisis, in fact, contributes to an inability to properly get, come to grips with the metacrisis in a serious way. I think there's also a reverse arrow of causation. I think the meta crisis contributes to an ongoing and increasing sense of domicide for people. The sense, and if, if you're not familiar with that, I, 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 the, domicide is the sense of not having a home. And it doesn't mean you don't have a dwelling. You can have a dwelling and still experience domicide. It's a sense of not being at home, that you don't belong, um, that there's a kind of fit between you and the world uh, and this causes, of course, anxiety, senses of absurdity, alienation. So I think as many people frame the world as dying, that exacerbates the meaning crisis for them. So I see the two having uh, a vicious feedback relationship with each other. So funny how they become like, memed terms, the meta crisis meets the meaning crisis. It's, it sounds like kind of markety. Um, I mean, they're facets of the same thing and the bi-directionality is clear. And I just wanna acknowledge that <clears throat> while we've both expressed what these things are and probably most people here have taken it in, uh, some of it online, <clears throat> 
the ability to actually unpack this adequately. What, what are visions of a world that instantiate meaning for people? What do we mean by meaning? Um, and what are visions of a world that address metacrisis, both long term and how we get there? And like, there's just no way we're going to do much. So we're just going to like touch random spots here. So a just a thought that came to mind is um, Joseph Campbell has some statement. I'm, I'm going to butcher it. You probably remember it. It was something like that uh, humans ask what the meaning of life is when they don't feel fully alive, but what they're seeking is a sense of full aliveness. I'm not trying to be reductive and say there is no important of some importance of some also cognitive sense of orientation and meaningfulness. But one thing that I have noticed, like philosophy and psychology have to work together and not just philosophy and psychology, but your physical health and lots of other things. So I, I don't want to try to use philosophy to take the place of where psychology is important for people who are dealing with meaning issues is I wrestled with almost every type of cognitively generated, at least in my awareness, existential angst about um, determinism and free will and the hard problem of consciousness and the heat death of the universe and all that shit for like, you know, like overly intellectual nerdy kids with big frameworks wrestle with. Um, but it was actually not just the intellectual frameworks I was wrestling with. It, like I was wrestling with those, but I started to recognize that uh, when I fell in love, I was not wrestling with them in the same way. And when I was actually in really deep connection and communion with nature, I wasn't wrestling with them in the same way. That there was a certain kind of, similar to my friend who I said had to get on MDMA because there was a state he was in that was then determining what resonated. Um, and so I started paying attention to it and very rarely did I see somebody's what they thought was cognitively generated existential angst very rarely did I see it survive falling in love. And uh, so I started to have a discipline with myself that if I was in if I was asking existential questions, I would look at non existential issues in my life like am I really tired. And is my health not that great? And do my relationships suck? And things like that that create a feeling where that I'm looking for ideas that map to that feeling. And that I didn't actually feel like I had a physiology or a psychology that was well tuned to address those hard problems in that place. And it was so fascinating that when I just had the discipline of I'm going to work to try to make sure I'm tuned as a cognitive instrument first, how different the entire process of existential meaning philosophy was yeah that uh, that converges with uh, an important aspect of my work where I talk about different kinds of knowing um, and uh, so you have propositional knowing that's oriented towards beliefs and stored in semantic memory uh, you have procedural knowing generates skills stored in procedural memory you have perspectival knowing that's about generating states of mind perspectives stored in episodic memory and you have participatory knowing, which is how attuned you are, uh, often uh, below levels of awareness to your environment. And that, uh, that's sort of stored in this weird entity we call the self. Um, and I think part of the meaning crisis is that we have a kind of propositional tyranny in our culture in which we are oriented to the propositional, to the exclusion of educating and cultivating the wisdom that I think is more found in the non-propositional kinds of knowing. And so I think that's deeply right. Um, and, and figuring out figuring out with the best science, but figuring out yeah, but what is it we can do to best help people with that attunement has been sort of crucial to what I've been trying to get at. Uh, because I think our culture is so fixated on systems of beliefs that it really distorts people and distracts them and diverts them from exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, I heard you, I heard you talking on a, a podcast earlier today and the interviewer was asking you what about decreasing attention spans from um, social media and 
how kind of relevance realization gets hijacked. And, and one of the things that um, I have noticed is that the hypernormal stimuli, whether through social media and kind of politics communication or um, sugar, fast food, porn, anything like that, the hypernormal stimuli proliferate in hyponormal environments where the authentic connection that creates meaningfulness is low. And um, it's very easy to see that like when friends go camping in nature with other friends, they just check their phones less. And when they're in a richer field of connectivity and creativity and experience and communication, they're seeking that thing less. So a huge part for me of how do we deal with hypernormal stimuli, obviously there is restructuring economics to not have perverse incentive at that scale because it's an asymmetric warfare that's a fucked up asymmetric war to just try to say the individual should have discipline against the multi-trillion dollar apparatus trying to hijack their attention so obviously it's not only an individual topic or even a community topic but insofar as we want to look at the bottom up side of it it's not just how do we develop more delayed gratification and more discipline to avoid hypernormal stimuli it's how do we create a richer life of authentically meaningful and connective things so that you don't have a vacuum seeking some kind of stimuli. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, so Her uh, Harry Frankfurt makes a very useful distinction between lying and bullshit that I, I, I've, I've found very useful for thinking about this. Um, the liar depends on your commitment to truth in order to manipulate your behavior. They convince you that something is true. It's not, but because you're committed to the truth, that alters your behavior. Whereas the bullshit artist tries to get you unconcerned of the question of truth and only attracted because of the salience. Um, this is how most advertising works. You, you all know that most of the advertising is false. If I ask you an interview after that, do you really think washing your hair with that shampoo will make beautiful women or men come into your life? You'll say no and then you buy the shampoo, right? And what, 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 what's really interesting about what you just said is unlike lies, like it's very hard to lie to yourself technically, but it's very easy to bullshit yourself. Because, all, because when you attend to something, right? That actually, there's, there's three dimensions that drive attention. And one of them is your history of what you've paid attention to. So when you pay attention to something, you're more likely to pay attention to it, so you're more likely to pay attention to it, which means when you walk into the store, it will leap out at you as salient, and that's enough to get you to buy the product or buy the political idea. And part of um, what I think is happening is, is that bullshit has a way of growing exponentially in a way that lying doesn't. And so I think error correction yes and avoiding error correction right because it uncouples you from do i understand this um like people people now confuse sending something that they haven't read on the internet with knowing what it was about so the, the point i'm making is right There, there's a degree in which, yeah, we have to get people into these richer environments. But I guess I, 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 I want to ask you a question is what, because I'm trying to get an answer to this question myself. What, and I don't just mean skills, I mean virtues. I mean, so there's skill that has an aspect of skill and state of consciousness, character trait. What virtues do we need to give people to be able to discern between lying and bullshit? such that they are capable of properly proportioning their attention and what they find salient to the things that are actually connected. Did that make sense as a question? Yeah, it's funny because I was actually just about to ask you a question that I was wondering that I thought you would have an answer to, that I actually am gonna avoid your question, do this one first and then come back to it because it might, <laughs> it's not avoid it. I actually wanna get, I wanna get to that. But when I was listening to um, listening to your talk earlier today, and you're talking about relevance realization that oftentimes what we're not paying attention to is critical, and we recognize that, and yet we don't have the literal neurological bandwidth to pay attention to literally everything. Um, and so there has to be some preferencing that happens. So something like people who are very good at being able to tell what might be relevant that isn't totally obvious, but that is relevant to something else is one of the main cognitive traits I look for in people. 
right? And like, if you want to work with me, by the way, if you're pretty good at knowing why something might be relevant to something else with good causal connections and then good at info compressing that, then probably talk to me. Like that's the that's something I look for a lot. Um, but I would notice in my own learning process, I have done something that looks a lot not like the normal approach to re relevance realization maximization, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. <clears throat> For some set of reasons early on, I started to realize that the things that I didn't think mattered still totally mattered, and I just didn't see the I, I just hadn't seen the causal connections and I started giving the benefit of the doubt that everything was actually important. And that if anyone thought it was important, I wanted to see through their eyes why they thought it was important. And I remember one time as a teenager, I was sitting people watching with a friend who was a hairdresser and I had zero fashion awareness at all. And she was watching all these things and I could tell and I'm like, what are you watching? What are you seeing? And she was talking about haircuts and fashion. I'm like, tell me actually like narrate your experience. And she was talking about the way that people's haircuts shaped their face or didn't or brought out their cheekbones or and why it affected their mood and the way other people related to them. And I'm like, there's a whole fucking world I've never seen. Like I've never seen any of that. And I think I'm seeing the world. And so I'm like, okay, there's actually in, interesting stuff in there. And then I remember talking to a mechanical engineer who is talking all about the slope of the curb and how water ran off and the nature of the um, screw threads on things. And I, so I just started seeking out every, everybody who saw the world in the most different ways about things that I totally thought were not interesting and really tried to see why it was interesting and relevant. So what I was trying to do was do the maps of relevance of the things that were outside of my current relevant set. And it was, um, you know, Khalil Gibran said, uh, it was in meditation upon the dewdrop that I discovered the mysteries of the ocean and this kind of sense that in a completely interconnected universe, the idea that anything isn't meaningful is actually at the basis of where violence and externality happens. So it wasn't letting my attention be diffuse and not try to connect it or just be a, distracted into like um, bullshit without real salience, but the like, I don't think I'm qualified to know what is relevant or not yet. And I want to assume relevance and everything and then look for it. I, that might be maybe the most important or one of the most important traits in my like educational proclivities. And I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. Excellent. How do you think about that versus other processes for pedagogy and for sure. developing people? And I will need a piece of your brain because you're a really interesting person. Um, <laughs> So, um, I mean, I think you're still guided in that process by relevance realization, uh, because a lot of relevance realization is taking place unconsciously and et cetera. And I'm sure you don't disagree with that. But I, the, the deeper answer, I think, is that, and I was privileged to work on a paper with most of the academics doing work on wisdom. And we were, the point was to actually produce a consensus theoretical construct. And this will get to your point in a second. And what came out as the key ability was a meta perspectival ability. So what thing most predicts the people that we judge to be wise is that they try to internalize perspectives other than their own, which is what you just described. And they try to not, but they don't just do it randomly, like they don't, like you said, you didn't disintegrate right? So they're complexifying, they're simultaneously differentiating and integrating. And then that, when you internalize that, that gives you metacognition, you become more capable of knowing your own cognition, because you internalize the perspective of other people on you. So when you take in multiple perspectives and complexify them, so they have emerging functions, you also complexify and drive the emergence of your metacognition, which improves your self knowing, which then improves your ability to choose which perspectives to internalize, and you can get a positive feedback loop going. And that sounds to me like what you just described. I'm curious how you would think about incorporating that kind of process into 
education. So, well, you said a few minutes ago that if you wanted to change education, you basically said, but I need to change the world. Um, and so I want to say something similar, um, because I think we have to ch challenge this framework about what the entity we're educating is, the embodied mind. So we have this notion that cognition is sort of self-enclosed, monadic, that it's monological, that we do our, most of our cognition is done inside here. It's monophasic. There's one privileged state of consciousness we should be in. And I think all three of those are fundamentally false. And that the framework, which we get from people like Locke, was built on those, those three things. And we have to bring in education in which children are being properly trained, not just taught, but properly trained uh, in what I like to call dialogos, the kind of conversation that is designed to do exactly what you were talking about, where it's not just a communication sharing of information. It's like, <clears throat> no, I want to get your perspective such that I can internalize it. We may not agree, but something emergent is going to happen for me because I've internalized your perspective and I try to afford you doing the same. So we afford each other self transcendence. We have to get that to be a crucial part. We have to train our kids to explore altered states of consciousness so that they get a sense of, whoa, my salience landscaping is way more malleable than I realized. And there's all kinds of powers and there's all kinds of perils. I think if you did just those two things, you would already start to enhance this ability I was talking about. Yeah, if you just take the first one that you mentioned, yeah. can see how that is actually an answer to conflict theory mm. and to metapolitics writ large at the sociological scale. It's the answer to externalities because the externality that is created is created by <clears throat> some group of people solving a problem where they're not in enough communication with enough of the other people in the landscape that would see where the externality was. So enough complex perspective seeking and desire to synthesize them. The two sources of all the problems in the world is conflict theory and mistake theory, the way that I frame it, problems that we cause on purpose and problems we cause on accident. And they both get addressed through that, as does the meaning crisis, as does psychological cognitive depth and complexity. So um, it's a pretty good starting place. For, for me, it's the heart of what um, I get from the whole Socratic tradition. Can you get to a place where you can really realize that the process of self-examination and self-knowledge is inherently bound up with affording other people to enter into you, like <clears throat> to get that meta perspectival loop running? That this is what I this is the great lesson I keep getting from Socrates. Is like, like I, 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 get, I get kind of pissed when people talk about finding themselves as if there's something in, if I just go deep enough inside, I'll find the magic kernel that is, shows how wonderful I really am, right? Where, 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 what, we're talk, what we're in fact trying to do right now, right? the more I can see through your eyes, and I'm drawn to because you're a powerful thinker, the more I can internalize that, I think the more I'll understand myself, but the more I can also afford you doing that, and then that means that we have an ability, right, to, like, it doesn't just, you know this, it doesn't just go up linearly. Our ability to cooperate and coordinate goes up exponentially. Okay, so a folly in this that I want to speak to is there is the capacity to take other people's perspectives, seek to be able to steel man it, seek to be able to communicate it so well that they have nothing to add, that is totally performative, it's rhetorical, and it doesn't have any real interiority, and it's super dangerous. And, um, you know, we'll see lawyers who are trained to be able to defend either side, regardless of believing in it, just through kind of rhetorical capability. And there's an attraction to meta paradigmatic work that an ego can have because you sound really fucking smart. Yeah, yeah. And you can win debates by always including and transcending and whatever. <clears throat> um, and but it's devoid of the actual give a shit that is the motive that i'm interested in yes which is 
not just wanting to be able to say what the other person would say, but be able to actually experience what it's like to be in their shoes deeply enough you can't actually separate yourself later. Excellent. And, and, and of course, again, back to the Socratic paradigm, you described Socrates' main combatants, the sophist, and they prided themselves on that, that they could make any argument win. And for me, they are, they're, they're, they were, they're consummate bullshit artists, is the truth was irrelevant. All that mattered was making some salient to win. Now, I, <clears throat> this is interesting. I want people who give a shit about truth, but who are pretty humble in their idea of what true means, yes. both in terms of the complexity of epistemology and ontology, and who give a shit about good and beautiful, and about just in a very real non-cognitive sense, the actual experience of other sentient beings. And that's exactly what I, where I was going. Yeah. Because Socrates, of course, famously argued that his, the core of his wisdom was, it was that he came to know what he did not know. Yeah. He had learned ignorance. Um, but he also professed himself to be a lover. So the way you can maintain the humility, like if I ever claimed to know my partner the way I can know a, like a chair, right? That's the end of my relationship, right? To be, in, to be in, and she's an astonishing person, uh, to be in love with her is to, right, is to understand that I want to know, I want, I want to afford her, I want to internalize her, I want to her, her, afford her self-transcending through me, because she affords it for me, but I never, I never want to frame her as a problem that I've grasped. Yeah. She's always a mystery that will elude any attempt to grasp her. And that's what, it, that, that, so in Socrates, right, he promoted in practice that capacity for that integration of humility and love. And so the way we, we, we look for the people that aren't bullshitting is we don't just pay attention to the propositional. We ask questions about, yes, but what are their virtues? Do they, do they give me good evidence of humility? Do they give me good evidence? Like, so much could be fixed if people would just love wisely. You, uh, I'd like to share a tip with people about how to tell the virtues that are real versus the ones that are signaled that I learned very, very late in life the hard way and probably still missing things on. But it's so fucking simple. Like it was so simple that I realized I was psychologically retarded in some way to have not recognized this. No, but I mean that seriously. And it's my friend Zach Stein, many of you probably know, introduced me to the psychological concept of selective inattention, like places where you have a blind spot because it defends some psychological frailty. And I think um, the untrustworthiness of other people was something I tried to turn a blind eye to as a survival strategy to believe in people in childhood. And so, and then just hold this redemptive focus that could make everybody trustworthy and, you know, whatever. So um, after having some experiences of really, really trying to build trust where all of the indicators said that that was a dumb idea and not possible and whatever. Um, and finally giving up painfully with it, I asked a friend who's diplomat and wise in this way, how, how the fuck do you decide who you trust? And he said something that was so obvious and like I couldn't believe that I had not done this. And you guys all might think it's obvious because you went to school and just like learned who not to trust at school. It's a place that I didn't learn. But he said, if they're an adult, if they're not still young and developing, if they're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, um, look at the relationships in their life that they've had for a long time. And if the kind of relationship you want to have is very different than the ones they have, it's probably not going to happen. You're probably not going to be the first one to have a very different relationship with them. The existing relationships in their life that they're a common denominator of is a good sign um, because they might bullshit with it. They might even bullshit themselves and then bullshit other people where it seems like they have these virtues long term that typically plays out right and so he's like look at the relationships that they've had for a pretty long time and try to find the ones that aren't there anymore you know and just get a sense of it and i was like duh 
And, but it's amazing how simplifying a painful experience is that one heuristic can be. Right. And it's not absolute. Of course, people can change. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I try to tell my kids to uh, at least learn about the family of somebody they want to enter a romantic relationship with. Um, and I did that in this case, and uh, my partner's family, they're amazing people. It's, it's like trying to be around them. They're just, they're astonishing. And, and, and so um, I think that's really good advice. I've, I've also adopted a heuristic, and it again seems really maybe simplistic, but I've been finding it very valuable. How often do I see somebody engaging in an act of self-correction that has long-term consequences for them? That for me makes them more trustworthy for me because if they are willing to do that, they, they are willing to correct their behavior. And they're also typically, again, it's a heuristic, they're willing to listen. And, and that, um, that to me has been very valuable. Yeah, I'll, I'll say the, what I think is probably pretty close to identical and um, the way I've been thinking about it is, um, as I was just mentioning, I had a blind spot. Everybody has blind spots, like pretty much by definition. So a psychologically he healthy person should be seeking their own blind spots, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you should, this is actually something that makes so little sense to me is why people in leadership positions in particular, knowing the emperor has no clothes story and knowing that if you're in a leadership position, people will bullshit you in the yes menu and whatever, like why people in leadership positions aren't scared as fuck that they have blind spots that are damaging things they care about that nobody's telling them. Like, I'm scared of that. I'm like, fuck, I don't, I don't want to be messing up stuff I care about because I don't fucking know. So I'm actively trying to get people that are really honest who will tell me those things. And I'm still knowing that, you know, that's a challenging thing. So um, blind spots aren't the problem, but defended blind spots. And so one of the things that, um, and this is kind of very cluster B in particular, is ideally I'm interested in people who are actively seeking their blind spots. Next is at least who are receptive. But if someone has defended blind spots, meaning they get mad at you for pointing it out, or at most give you some kind of like performative thank you and then push you away or something, um, and they're not specifically not willing to be held accountable to change, that's a sign that I probably not want to work that closely. Yeah, you probably know that as people go up the hierarchy too, their ability to take the perspective of others drops down significantly, um, which may exacerbate the very thing uh, you're talking about. I, I, I'm concerned about that issue too, a lot. And you know, in, even before whatever this is, even as a professor, I was concerned with that. Um, so can we go back to your virtue question? Sure. W will you reframe it again? What are the set of virtues that? Yeah, what, so I would say the virtue and the virtuosity that allows one to reliably, regularly and reliably discern uh, bullshitting from lying so that people can reorient towards the kinds of connections that actually do sustain meaning in life. I, I grew up watching Krishnamurti, so I had just such an affection for him. But I remember talking to other people who didn't grow up with that affection, and they're like, why is that dude pissed off all the time? And because he would start his talk, and he'd be like, can we take this serious? Can we be very serious about this thing? And But he, he was trying to say, like, how do we actually solve human conflict? And I don't want to be just saying this as entertainment. And you go home, and nothing fucking changes. Like, do you also give a shit about solving human conflict and the meaningfulness of life? And so similar to the thing I said about for parents, like, take the meaningfulness of your kid's life more seriously, but then also have less certainty that you know how, which means that you have to be engaged mm -hmm. in the process with them. Um, <clears throat> it seems like to the degree that someone actually does take life as meaningful and their own life as meaningful, that's a pretty strong resilience to bullshit. Like it, it's, it's, um, you know, repellent, right? Because 
it's pretty, someone has this relevance filter of is reality happening? Because meaning can't be detached from reality, right? And if I don't get the sense that reality is happening, then I want to kind of quickly move through that. That seems to be the most fundamental one to me is actually like a, um, I mean, obviously there are epistemic skills. Obviously there are psychological insights to see if people are bullshitting, like we just pointed out. But it seems like the most, uh, and there's obviously a mindfulness to even be paying attention. Mm -hmm. Am I just being entranced and entertained or not? So like, I don't want to take all those for granted. But the depth of care about how each of the moments of our life are being invested seems to be the heart of it, motivationally. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the knowing that the, the uh, that's what I meant about loving wisely, knowing how to care properly, proportionally, um, seems to be the key thing. Um, and, 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 and so two, two things come up for me. One is, first of all, what you just, the first thing you said about there's a deep connection between meaning, at least how I'm using it, and I think it's how you're using it, and a connectedness to reality. Um, and part of the problem is that that is not sort of um, the default mode in which people understand meaning. Um, most people, we know there's good research to show that people can, that these three things are different. Um, wealth and socioeconomic status, subjective well-being and meaning in life. And our culture has collapsed them all into one blob, right? Um, wealth only contributes to improved uh, subjective well-being, sort of how good you feel. I'm feeling pretty good, that's subjective well-being. And wealth only makes a significant difference to that when you get out of poverty. Once you're out of poverty, you have to have huge increases in wealth to make minor differences in subjective well-being. So it's actually irrational uh, to be primarily wealth-driven. The problem is, so those two things are confused. And then, okay, but subjective well-being, I should feel good. Well, actually, subjective well-being and meaning in life can vary independently. A really good way of seeing that is to have a kid. When you have a kid, all of the measures that contribute to subjective well-being go down. Your finances go down, your health goes down, you don't sleep, your partner doesn't like you as much as they used to, right? Uh, um, you're getting diseases, like every, by every measure, <laughs> by every measure, subjective well-being goes down. Why do people do it? They want to be connected to something that has this, a reality and a value independent of their own existence. You can ask people what's, what is meaningful to them, and if you want to get at this, you ask them, what would you like to exist even if you don't? Right? And so part of it is, like, that's the first part. How do we get that? Like, we got to break apart that muck, that conflation. And then we have to properly re-understand love about that again. Our culture is messed up about this because we think love is a feeling. That's ridiculous. Like that's it's like love isn't a feeling. Well, it's an emotion. No, it's not. Because love can make you really sad. It can make you really happy. It can make you really angry. It can make you really jealous. It can make you really frustrated. Love is an existential stance. It's a way of committing yourself to a particular connection to the world, especially to a particular person and their world. Our culture, this is why romantic comedies are so atrocious. Because they are, I mean, seriously, because they're designed to convince you that infatuation is what love is. Have you, when have you seen a movie about this couple's been really happy for 30 years? So, what I'm saying is, we need to, we need to re-understand, I'm proposing to you, we need to re-understand love as a virtue, and we need to re-understand meaning in a way that prioritizes the thing you said, which is that connectedness to reality, to, 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 being, to want to be connected to something that has a reality and a value independent of your egocentric existence. Yeah, I like you saying love is a kind of existential stance. 
um, specifically saying rather than love is an emotion that there's all of these emotions that love can elicit. Um, <clears throat> I have a rabbi friend that says that at the heart, love arises from clarity of perception. Exactly. Because when you actually recognize that the person that you're perceiving has interiority and that exactly them has never existed and never will exist again, yes. and there's perfect irreplaceability of what they are, then there is this kind of irreplaceable, thus infinite value and the recognition of that value and meaningfulness is the, the existential love that you said. So then it, I can get angry at someone who's gonna hurt it. I can get yes. afraid of it being harmed. All of those emotions arise from the love because if there wasn't love, I would give no shits. This is great. I, I quoted this quote earlier. I don't know if, uh, if you heard it. Uh, it's a favorite quote of mine and uh, it's from a gem of a book, The Sovereignty of the Good by Iris Murdoch. Um, she said, you know, love is the recognition that something other than yourself is real. And I think that's exactly that. It's that, it's that profound, wait, there's, a, there's something other than me really, is really real. Like, see how useless the language is? Of course you can say that. But, yeah. I, I mean, I think our deepening relationship with perception and cognition and yeah. meaning uh, it, there are things that happen in it every day but there's a few points that stand out a um, couple of them for me I, I think i'll share and maybe i'm curious if you would too because uh, jonathan was just telling me yesterday that telling more personal stories is important um <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've had people say some of the things to me i remember I was like 16 or 17, having this experience where I was, I was meditating and then I opened my eyes and I was watching the sunset in this beautiful area. And I was just kind of in awe, right? Kind of a, everybody's had that experience, but in awe at the beauty of this planet and nature and the sky and everything. And then I had this self-reflection of like, if I had the choice as some, an incarnated spirit. Uh, if I had the choice to incarnate and experience every difficulty I have ever experienced to just have this one moment, I would totally do it. Just for this one moment, as opposed to nothing, right? Like the, it's infinitely valuable, basically, infinitely precious. And I'm like, fuck, totally. Like I, I the other things don't matter at all relative to the depth of experience. And then I realized that I've had thousands of experiences for which I would incarnate an entire life just for that one experience. And then when I really reflected on that, I'm like, the, the ongoing what's in it for me shifts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a sense of like, I have already experienced many, many lives worthy of living. And the fact that more stuff keeps happening is just gravy and is awesome. And I appreciate it, but all future life is not ensured to have that yet. And not everyone else has had as much fortune and I can actually do something about that, mm -hmm. not just my own experience. And so with that recognition came a kind of depth of gratitude but that comes a kind of obligation to other sentient experience. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I, I find that like everyone I trust the most has had an experience like that. And until somebody has the what's in it for me, hungry ghost thing creates some degree of untrustworthiness, like all conflict theory still comes from that. Mm. Yeah, that you, I've had similar moments, um, but, but um, there was a, this will make me sound more nerdy than you, but I was reading Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> I, I love reading Marcus Aurelius. <clears throat> and, you, and, and you know, you can know something, but you don't know it. Like you know, uh, Tolstoy has the death of the Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich always knew he was going to die, the way you know that two plus two equals four. But one day after he hurt himself, 
Ivan Illich knew he was going to die. It was that kind of shift. And I, and I, and I got it that, like, and you, like when you say it, it sounds to, we, we, we were so concerned, we think we can alleviate the hungry ghost by somehow maximizing the hor horizontal dimension of our life, how long it's going to endure. And, and the fact that it gets ended so ultimately undermines that and renders our lives somehow meaningless. And Aurelius picks up on a thing from Seneca. He said, even when you're in a corner, you can jump, jump into the sky, even if you're painted into a corner. And then I realized, and then Mar Marcus Aurelius basically said, but almost like, like exactly like you, but if I have that one moment of infinite depth, it doesn't matter how long. And I really got it. I really got it. And, and, and I got it to a point where, and don't take this the wrong way, I got I still won't step into traffic or, you know, you know, stand close to radiation or anything like that. But a, a, a kind of visceral fear of dying left me. Um, uh, and for me, um, yes, like you, I want to know people who have experienced that depth. Um, but, but in addition to the awe way, I'm also interested in people that have experienced it in the awful way. Uh, one of the wisest person I met in my life at a very pivotal point in my life said to me, John, don't get into relationship to somebody who's not experienced grief. Because grief is the eye that you get, the eye that allows you to see the holes in other people where they've been hurt. And if they haven't had grief, they haven't, they haven't had to confront that vertical dimension. Um, and so I also look for people, I think people who have got, and our culture, again, doesn't handle this well. We, we try to push it aside or, 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 or give, give the Hallmark card. It's all right. You know? It's like, no, it's not. Right. Grief for me is going through grief and people have gone through it, uh, uh, like they get something. Can I tell a short story around this? It's, it's, my, it's, my, it's, it's one of my favorite stories from the Buddha. This woman comes to him and her son has died. Child. She is torn by grief. And she says, will you resurrect him? Now the Buddha always refused to perform miracles. In fact, he said, this is how you know somebody is not one of my disciples if they offer to perform a miracle. That's very good advice, by the way. But she kept pestering and pestering and pestering him. And he says, okay, I'll do this for you. But you have to do one thing for me. Go into town. You have to get a mustard seed. And she said, well, I can do that. Said, no, 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 no. You have to get a mustard seed from a household that has not tasted grief. So she goes, hello, do you have any mustard seed? Yes, yes. Has anybody in this house? It's grief. Yes, I lost my brother. She goes to the next one. Same thing. Next one. Same thing. Next one. Same thing. And then she goes, oh. And she goes back to Siddhartha and she said, thank you. That also for me is, so yes, I want people that have experienced those moments of ecstasis that take us beyond ourselves, but I also want people who have confronted the depths of despair that take us beyond ourselves and come out of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And maybe Sorry, just briefly, we've got about 10 minutes left. I just want to let you know. Yeah, I, li I, I like that Buddha story. Um, I read a quote and I don't remember it was attributed to some indigenous tribe, and I don't remember which one, um, but it said, uh, people who can't grieve together can't make good choices together. And I thought it was really insightful because the choices we make will have some consequences, some of which we can anticipate, some which we can't anticipate, and to take responsibility for the fact the choices we make are gonna cause some harm. Like, how do we do that, right? Excellent. Um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, it's interesting. The same rabbi friend in our like second conversation asked me if I was post tragic as a way of trying to see if I was trustworthy, which was um, if you haven't gone into devastating tragedy and then come out on the other side of it, no idea what's going to happen to you when it does happen. And so it's, it's interesting because I think like only if someone has experienced the beauty of the world enough that it's both sacred and they're committed to it for everyone else and they feel full, which doesn't mean they can't want and enjoy more, it just means they don't need it in the same way. And only if someone has gone through saying, well, one, hard things enough that their kind of character emerges, but also ideally things that devastate their previous sense of self and worldview. So there is then some new self that has to emerge. But then another one I would add is um, trauma healing is really important because you can get resilience gifts and you can get philosophic insights and you can get strength from going through things and still be left with shrapnel. And it has an effect. And one of the things that I've noticed in terms of people's fear of death is that their unresolved trauma gets projected into the unknown. And that to the degree there's a bunch of unresolved trauma, then death and the dark and the unknown are scary because my, again, it's that what seems true is that which resonates with what it feels like inside. And I can't be really good friends with the unknown if my experience of the known actually feels overwhelmingly traumatic, right? Because that's what gets projected. So I think having trauma and getting through it, working through the way that trauma lives inside of us, being connected enough to the trauma in the rest of the world that we aren't narcissistic and being connected enough to the beauty we've already experienced and the intrinsic irreplaceable beauty in everybody else. Like all of those are parts of what's necessary. I think that was beautifully and well said. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like that idea. I, I hadn't heard you say this before. Um, the, uh, it's sort of the opposite of, uh, the, was it Becker or Beck? I can't remember his name. It's Becker. Yeah, yeah. That, that, but that idea that you can do the Epicurean game with people. Like, oh, well, I'm afraid of non existence. Well, you didn't exist before your birth. Does that terrify you? No. You can't possibly experience non existence. So why are you scared of it? Oh. When, like, and, the, and there's a sense in which that can provoke people, but I find that those, like, when I do that, it's, it doesn't do much, right? Because it's subsemantic. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. And, and, it, and that's exactly the point. Because, well, back to, like, you know somebody who is pro properly processed. Well, it's a heuristic. But you could get a good sense of how they can behave at a funeral. Because the people who shut up and sit beside the person who's grieving and know how to be fully present with them are the only ones that help. And it's really hard for people to shut up and really do that. And I think it's, I hadn't put this together, but I think it's because they're doing exactly, they're trying, right? They're, they're projecting into the void and then they're trying to ameliorate their own projective fear in what they're saying to the person behind them. Does that land with you? Yeah, that's just that just those came together for me just now. Yeah, the um, instant comfort someone who's grieving <clears throat> and um, tell them the person's in a better place and aren't you grateful that you knew them and whatever, even if that's true and even if that's where the person will inevitably come. Either that means that person has never been through it, or it means that they, well, they've never been through it, right? Like they went into it, couldn't deal with it. Yes. And so there's a bypass of their own experience. And obviously I can't empathize with you in depth, an experience that I'm trying to avoid in myself, which was why that question of post-tragic, right? If someone is going to especially lead anything, which also means lead people who will go into tragedy, you better be able to be fucking with them mm -hmm. in it, right? Mm -hmm. Which means, able to be within them those dimensions of self too yeah for me that's 
for me, that's where any, when, if people have any virtue or virtuosity in the non-propositional, that's where, that's the kind of situation where it really shows itself. Right? That, 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 that capacity for comportment is it, that um, is the only thing that's actually comforting in those kinds of situations. And then I wonder, but I wonder about what you just said also, because there's similarities, right, between grief and wonder. Wonder makes you call your world and yourself into question, and so does grief. So I'm also one, like, learning to be with other people when they're ecstatic is also something we don't. What's so easy to, obviously, if someone is not capable of being with ecstasy in themselves because of repression or embarrassment yeah. or whatever, they might not. But also, if they're in their own lack and scarcity, they might just go directly into envy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> yes. So someone's ability to be with other people's pain and also their ability to be in celebration about other people's joy, with regardless of whether they're in the same win or not, is definitely also a huge part of psychological health and trustworthiness. So now that we're running out of time, I'll, I'll ask you a question that should take about four hours to answer, <laughs> which is the, the place where people had got that kind of education was usually within religious frameworks. And yet, for most people, you know all the data on the nuns and so forth, these are not viable homes for them anymore. And often not because they don't believe in the propositions, it's because they regard what is happening in that world as fundamentally irrelevant to them. It's not viable. Like when James talks about propositions that are just aren't viable for you. You can't even consider they're true or false. You just can't take them on. How do we, you asked me an education question. I want to know what you think about how do we get the kind of multi-scale, comprehensive, self-organizing education in this kind of thing without the legacy of religions? Uh, and you know, this is part of the project I have about the religion that's not a religion. How do, we, how do we properly understand that functionality in a way that doesn't commit us to a worldview that was born in the axial age and is increasingly irrelevant to, to the kinds of issues we're facing? People still fall back on religion when they have to go to the funeral or when they're going for the wedding or when there's a christening. Like there's still all of this. They know that they, there's something they, there's a sense that they, part of it's just cultural inertia, but there's also a sense, no, 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 these are, I, I, I gotta get, there's something, I, sh I need guidance at, at these, you know, these pivot points in my life. Where should they go? I think there's both a version of reifying, deepening and updating the existing religions that actually matters as well as the development of new ones. Um, <clears throat> I think the entire Islamic world in the near term is to abandon Islam. I think there are actually ways of relating to what's there, both in terms of the belief systems and in terms of the inner development and tribal or cultural development process. There are much more life enhancing and less life enhancing versions of it. So I think actually the support of the health, healthy updates and reification of those traditions is actually part of the story, uh, as well as kind of new philosophic schools, philosophic, psychologic, etc. I think it's very easy to see, it's very easy to critique all of the problems of religion that make us want to get rid of it and um, to see how either it was purely a power play or got co-opted by power plays. But it's also pretty easy to see that there were authentically meaningful processes, whether it was how to work with psychology, how to develop morals and ethics, how to create shared numinous experience with others where you had a basis of trust with each other that was actually beyond life and death, uh, meaning that there was something that mattered to you, the question you asked of what what do you care about even if you don't exist anymore? To have a whole group of people that all hold something as sacred beyond their own life that is shared creates a basis for trust through a transcendental process that's fucking profound for culture, right? <clears throat> um, and so one of the reasons I think a lot of people go back to religions after a more scientifically 
literate worldview is because of the need out of existential flatland. And, you know, Ken and lots of people have talked about the kind of regress to something that has existential depth, even if it seems less intellectually congruent. Obviously, we don't want to have a trade off between intellectual congruence and um, and meaningfulness. Um, I would argue that the most deep, wise, charitable interpretations of many of the religions are actually fucking profound and uh, and commensurable with scientific knowledge. I know you have a relationship with Taoism. I wrote this um, piece called The Dance of the Tao and the 10,000 Things that was saying they can dance together. And basically the study of the 10,000 things is what I would think of as science and kind of formal logical epistemology. And I'm talking about how that, even in the limit, never brings you to the Tao. And yet it's not worthless. And it doesn't have to obscure the Tao, but it usually does. And so how does somebody relate to the fact that the limit, there's like a, there's a con, there's something wrong in the Leibnizian concept of the limit, which is when you factor that that algorithm has to process on some computational substrate that takes time to get to infinity takes eternity, which means you never get to infinity. You always have some transfinite thing. And so whether you think of it that way, or you think of the kind of Gödel's theorem or Tarski's theorem of it, there is a binding to the ontologically unknowable and sacredness being bound there, which is also has to be at the core of governance theory, because what are you optimizing for? The, the Tao that is nameable is not the eternal Tao. The metric set that is optimizable is not worth optimizing for. And so that really fucks up AI governance ideas as it should, right? We don't want to disintermediate complex wise human judgment that is connected to the unknown unknown set becoming increasingly known and yet always in relationship to the unknowable. Um, and so there's a way that we can relate to the science, right? The ontology of the separate things into parts, name them, create a syntax for that. There's a way that we can relate to that that can actually sensitize us to the Tao rather than desensitize us, where we actually become aware of how fucking complex and orderly and profound everything is without thinking that our knowledge that ever converges on everything. So we stay completely bound to the unknowable. And we actually just get greater sense of the depth of what that means through the extent of the knowable. And in that way, the, the 10,000 things and the Tao can dance. And it's kind of in that, Right, so when we talk about religion, there's a relationship to the unknowable, but it's not separate from the relationship to the process of knowing, right, that you, they have to be co-developed. And um, now I didn't really answer the question of like, what do I see the future of ed education and culture and everything being that develops that? It's obviously also gonna start with parents uh, at one level, right, and, and different, well, there's bottom up and top down and kind of medium ways it can start. I'll say, I agree that it is critical, and I agree that it's a conversation that needs more time. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say, I felt tremendous resonance with everything you said. It aligns with convergent, and I, 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 and not in a dismissive way, uh, with a lot of how I see my project. And it would be great if perhaps you and I had a conversation about just that. Let's do it. Well, um, it's really hard to follow Daniel and John Mazzucchi. It's probably, it would have been my worst nightmare two and a half years ago. <laughs> Actually, two and a half years ago, I probably would have left. I would just go away. <laughs> but, um, so we're, what we're doing here today is we're going to do a session to reflect on our journeys in the context of rebel wisdom and invite you to reflect on your journeys using our questions to reflect on what it meant to you. And we know it's a sliding scale of intensity for different people and a sliding scale of transformation 
but we want to use these last moments together to really honor what it has been and what it will be. So, um, Rebel is my, like my, my journey and Nick's, we, um, uh, I was going to say we're intense people, but maybe not, we're um, passionate. Maybe that I but <laughs> So we, um, we really went like full on with Rebel Wisdom because at the same, it was through COVID. So as Abby was saying, we just did a lot of things that you're going to see in the presentation. But um, I, so we're calling the session um, Life Cycle Sensing Session. And what we're going to basically is, um, you yeah, know, what I said, it's a hero's journey and throughout we're going to invite you to reflect. I just want to say too that I came all the way from Australia and Nick came from New York and I, my girl and I told her that I was going to come here and speak and she said, whatever you do, don't look at anyone, <laughs> don't cry and pretend to be confident and I'm about to just not do anything. <laughs> I look in the screen, which I don't know, but they were here, where the emergent commons people and Nick, which I feel deeply, <laughs> like we're like, oh my god, we're like a family, and we just met. And there's probably like 10 other people here that I feel so deeply connected to, so this is not trivial. It feels to me that, you know, if it wasn't for love, for this, well, I've always been created in, in a deep sense, I wouldn't have traveled <laughs> 30 hours. Me, so, yeah. <laughs> so I'll be very yang. <laughs> um, in contrapoint to that. Yeah, um, so we're meeting for the I flew in this morning from New York. We're meeting for the first time. We've known each other for three years. Um, so the session is, yeah? Oh, the whole is my, yeah, here we go. There you go, that makes me sound more <laughs> rappery. Um, so we'll talk about our journey. And the reason we took all the chairs out as well is because we also want to hear a bit about your journey. So it's a little bit of a participatory, this is what happened before, this is what happened when we got here to rebel together, and this is what we're thinking about next. And that's the final part of it, and then we'll move into sorrow in the end, led by Tom. What, what seeds are we going to scatter uh, as a, the, the closing of the rebel? Flower, and um, we'll also be moving around the room a bit, and we'll also be moving in and out of head and felt sense as well. So we'll be kind of moving up and down the body as we do some of these exercises together. Um, and that's it. Yeah, we'll, over to you for the first exercise. I think. Um, I think you too. Yeah. It's... Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so as I said, we um, we traveled from you know Australia and New York. So we wanted we thought it would be interesting to see how many people traveled to come here. So we wanted to invite people that traveled two hours to come here to move to the left. More than two hours. Your left. More than two hours. Yes, yeah, my left. Your right. More than two hours. That's here. So let's go. Move. Move move that way. If you can travel more than two hours. And you can travel less than two hours if you can. And just have a look around of the amount of people that travel more than two hours to be here. Again, it's not trivial. Then how about more than five hours? So the two hours, three hours, four hours move here. <laughs> and if it's more than five hours, you stay here. <laughs> Four and a half. <laughs> <laughs> That's about twenty percent of people. So just have a look around. How many people? And how many people travel? And I was. It doesn't look like it's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And again, have a look around. And how many people travel more than 15 hours? 
Okay, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna um, move you back here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna carry on the embodied check-in. <laughs> okay. So we're just railing this is this is an embodied check-in, as everyone said, so we're just railing the energy of the like what we're dealing with it. So uh, in the room. So energy, if you are these uh, my word, let me guess which one of these two is my word. My word was knackered, and her word was sprightly. So so if you're feeling sprightly, we'll do, do it all together at the same time. If you're feeling more sprightly, you go up. Also affect, like ah. and if you're feeling a bit medium, and if you're feeling knackered, you go down a bit like that. Just so we can feel like how's the energy in the room? Go. Amazing. Don't make it, don't make it, people. What a lot of five hours cost travel. Quite a lot of energy, so yeah. You're going to get the back hole. Yeah, no. Because that's why. Oh, you okay. know. All right, all right. So, so as you can see, we haven't had a ton of rehearsals on. Right? <laughs> we're just so, like, then we just met. Somebody. Except 20 hours on line, but we didn't talk about this at all. We were just going to talk about this now. We got self um, So now it's, it's happy sad. So, you know, there's a lot going on in, in the energy and David's absence and the closing and what next and all of that. So, yeah, that's real. And we'll play with that a little bit in a second. So, if you're feeling generally happier, I would say, or more up like that, in a sense, uh, move forward. And if you're feeling more grief or sound like, move back. Which is, that's just to think I'm close. To what I feel for. And I'm assuming the people in the back are coming closer, it's just you don't have room to come closer, so it's just happy, but uh, okay. um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm noticing that I feel, um, so I feel extremely tired, like, um, and I feel so much love and happy to be here, and it's, at the same time I feel um, grief. I do feel um, a little bit of sadness in my heart for, um, for not knowing when this is going to happen again and in which format, and I'm just letting this be part of me too. So there are a couple of frames that we're going to use to talk about our journeys, which we'll find, we feel is helpful, I find it's really helpful, which is the cycles of life and death. So life and death was talked about quite a bit by Daniel and, and uh, Vicky. And so um, we're going to use so the cycles of birth, growth, this compost, decay, death, and rebirth. So, um, and, and the other, the other frame we're going to use is the head, heart, and hara hands. And so that's the, the intelligence of the mind. So clarity, discernment, um, cognition, and the intelligence of the heart, connection, love, uh, intelligence <coughs> of the hara, which to me represents mostly courage, and hands doing, actualizing things in the world. Yeah, so we'll just refer back to those two models as we go through. Yeah. Um, and Hang on just a second, there's an online problem. They're saying that something that says choose a thing on the this. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Choose a thing. Try it again. Death. Okay. So the first bit of our journey was our road to rebel, me and Adriana, and then we're going to actually do a bit about yours. And this is actually the thing I also want to say about this is in the process of thinking about our rebel journey together, we also actually processed it together as well. So it's, it's like we wouldn't have known this was true until we did it. So it's also as we were working our way through this, the Romans were also like, wow, that happened? Like that, like really? We were so this is this is us before we got here, right before we got here, this is what was going on. Uh, this is me. So this is me as a happy gay man dude in 2017. This is me getting less happy with gay man. I worked at like MTV and Facebook and for real. And I was dressed like this and I had this haircut. And this is me getting much less happy. Um, and being like, why am I so unhappy? Like with everything. And then this is me in around 2018 getting 
existentially questioning in a way that was painful and began a kind of crumbling process that I didn't understand and was scary. And at lunch, actually, I was talking to Akila and a few others, how common this experience was for people in the sort of five-year period or so leading up to their rebel encounter. And then in 2019, I had a, a bit of a spiritual emergency, you could say. And uh, it actually, you know, I've compared notes with David on the David Fuller on this as well. You know, we both went through something, not at the same time, but I think that's a characteristic shared by many people here. So as I was coming towards Rebel, I was sort of in the first afterburn of like a meltdown, basically. What many people were saying is, Nick, having a nervous breakdown? Is that a midlife crisis or is that a spiritual emergency? So Nick had a lot of fun putting this together. <laughs> so this is me in Hong Kong when I lived in Hong Kong, and that was my version of game I And then I had my type of um, awakening, and I went really f full into women's mysteries, and I work a lot with women. And then I felt that was lacking something for me, so I went into the developmental models and developmental theory, and I started working as a coach and facilitator with development. And Unbeknownst to me, I made a little bit of shadow of my feminine work. Even though I would infiltrate bits of the feminine in my developmental model um, work, I basically was playing by what I saw as the reflect, what people gave me back for the value that they saw in me, I played by that. So basically, the developmental theory, Adriana was paid more and paid more, whereas the women's mysteries, Adriana was barely higher than not very um, trusted. <laughs> so I was like, I, unbeknownst to me, I was actually internalizing DNA without knowing. And that to me, just before Rebel Wisdom, which is when we sold our house in Sydney and we moved into a community where um, I have two goats, which Nick laughs at when I, um, we talk on the phone and we hear the boats behind and, um, you know, and we live in nature and we live in a sustainable house and we, and I do, so the way I live my life feels deeply in integrity and at the same time I was feeling at the point that I wanted to enter, I, actually I didn't know that I wanted to enter herbalism, but the question I was walking with is like, I'm here, here, and there are these things there happening there, and I want to go there. How do I go there? I want to talk to these people, which I don't. I didn't know who these people were, but there were some people somewhere, and I wanted to talk to them. So that was that was my question, and that's when the rebel was appeared. Yeah, and um, and we came in like this. We're going to turn over to you in a minute, just to think about where you were at with this process. Uh, but when we got here, interesting, we both came through the same door. There was all this stuff going on in Rebel, and we both came in through these videos of Daniel and Jenny Will and uh, I think Jordan Hall on a couch talking and just going into flow states when they were dialoguing and they fucking blow our minds. We were just like, what the fuck is that? We were like, what is that? And, and I remember saying to the friends at the time, I was like, watch this. And friends were like, what? What's the big deal? I was like, no, watch. And they were like, what? What are you talking about? And I was like, that's important. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. And she had the same experience, and we were like, what is that? And it was like this weird siren call that we had to go towards. And I was, my question was a bit more onanistic, I think, than, than like, what should live after I die or something like that. It was more, uh, although I respect that question, um, it was more like, a, I was more working with like, what's the sum of my soul? My sum of my soul feels unsung. I'm 50 something, and I don't feel like I've sung my song. What, what is it? And where do I sing it like that? And that um, when I heard that call, that conversation between Daniel, um, Jimmy Wheel, and Jordan Hall, which I imagine a lot of you um, have watched, yeah, you can see a lot of them. And um, it was not only where they were speaking from that I was recognizing, and but it was actually the choice that David and Ali made to highlight that and to speak um, John's language to make salient, because to a lot of people it would just be another conversation. And the, the fact that there were some people paying attention to that and thinking it was valuable. So I was interested in the whole thing. I was like, I'm interested in who's thinking that, I'm interested in who's having the conversation, and I want to have the conversation. So that's what brought us, brought us in there. So this is the last thing I'm going to say. Um, and then Tom is going to take us through a uh, ritual. I might actually say something during the ritual, so it's not exactly the last thing. But 
Um, I was just unpacking the candles, um, which are going to be part of that. And I got to these ones that were like the extra candles I brought and um, remembered where they came from. And they actually came from the last men's weekend we did, which was in February, on the day of the mega storm, which you might remember it was the worst storm that hit Britain in like, I don't know how many, 100 years or something. And so all these men um, came like literally bursting through the door from like prowling winds. And um, we, uh, all the electricity went off in the venue. And it turned out that everything was connected to this one system, the toilets, the food, like everything. nothing worked. So one of our assistants ran out and got like a million candles. This is, this is one of them. Um, and you know, the, the, the retreat went really well, but it, it, I was quite touched when I picked it up because that's how we really began. David and I really, um, yes, there's an intellectual quality to everything we do, but the heart of rebel wisdom for me has always been those retreats, not because it's around masculinity per se, but because of the ways of being that came out of them. Um, and the enormous amount of compassion and love in the room, which touched me every time. I think we did 10 or 12, it was really beautiful. There's some men here, in fact, who were there, um, quite a few. So. It's really good to see your faces. Um, and that, that energy is what created Rebel Wisdom. That's how we created Rebel Wisdom from that point. And we created something together that was be, sort of bigger than both of us and kind of beyond both of us. We didn't just create it together. It was created by you as well. It was created by everyone who watched a film, everyone who engaged in the community, everyone who came to our events. So I have this kind of question right now, which is what, what are we laying to rest right now? And that's the thing we're laying to rest. We're laying to rest something that we all created together. David and I are still going to be doing um, our utmost to bring these kind of ideas and practices into the world. I, for me, I want to bring them mainstream. That's really what I want to do. I want to take these ideas, probably dumb them down somewhat, um, <laughs> and really make help be a part of bringing them into the mainstream. For me, that's my mission right now. Um, and so I'm really curious what everyone wrote on your post-its, but everyone here has a purpose, has a mission. And my real hope is that the thing that doesn't die, like I said before, is us and our connection and what we can create together, this field that we build together. <sighs> so that being said, um, I want to open the space to close Rebel Wisdom now. And it's going to come in a few parts. We're going to warm up a bit with Tom. And then we're going to um, really put it to rest and have the chance to just say what that is, what we want to say to Rebel Wisdom before it ends. And then we're going to celebrate together. Okay. So, Tom, oh, one sec. Thank you. And before Tom is your go, I just want to say, Ali, we have cherished David here several times today. And uh, we really put our focus and love and attention and appreciation towards him in his absence of being here and still being in spirit. So I really want to take the moment to uh, bring all that appreciation and attention and love and care uh, towards you. Thank you for being such a brother and holding the space today by yourself and with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm, oh, yeah, this works. Okay, good. So, um, you probably read that book about flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It says, flow is found at the intersection of discipline and surrender. And um, sometimes I think of Ali and David as discipline and surrender. I'm not, I think they swap parts. 
I say, um, and I learned this, that they introduced me to Jamie Wheel. So I thought, if I'm going to, and he flew me to America to work with his team in the Flow Genome Project, I thought, I'm going to have to come up with something customized, something more impressive than uh, me high chicks and me high. So I said, yeah, Jamie, he's all very well, but I think flow or the groove is found at the intersection of discipline, surrender, and mischief. And I said, oh, I like that. So I thought, right, I'm going to be the mischief guy. And I was driving to a gig through the city and the police stopped me. And they said, you look a bit mischievous. <laughs> and they, um, I had my drum with me. And uh, I said, no, look, I've got, uh, I'm going to a trade conference. I've got the paperwork, I've got everything. I'm on a website. Blah, blah, blah. And they said, that's all very well, but we think you are in league with Extinction Rebellion. Um, and they took me to Charing Cross Police Station. They locked me up for 12 hours uh, on suspicion of about to be a, being a, about to cause a public nuisance. <laughs> so I thought, I didn't get a chance to do it that day. So why don't we do it now? And um, they broke my drum, actually. Look at that. Look at that. And that, they thought that shut me up. What they didn't know is that I've got 100 drums like that. <laughs> so it's not as deep as that one, but let's see if it works. So I'm just going to strap it on. So at this point, you can start to think, oh no, it's so great just being in the dark looking. But in a moment, I'm going to get us to circle up. But first of all, I'm just going to see, every group has a rhythm. I'm just going to see what your rhythm is. Yeah, your rhythm is predominantly this. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not universal. I did see a couple of eyebrows being raised in time four to the floor. So um, I'm going to uh, invite you to put one foot forward in front of you. Could be left, could be right, your favourite foot. Um, and we're going to move together, forward and back. We're just going to go forward, back, forward, back. I need another microphone here now. Back. Forward, back, forward. Okay, so I'm going to divide the room now. Can you, um, this is a, it's a very um, ancient African ritual. So can you, it isn't, I'm making it up. Can you, um, can you divide? And you people look that way, look that way. And you people look that way. Yeah, self-select. Okay, and we're going to go forward and back together. <laughs> you don't have to glue yourself to the wall. We, we don't need a big gap down the middle. So that's great. So, uh, yeah, very good. All right, yeah, wait there. So now we go forward and back. Forward, back. Is that the... Yeah. And you see, some people are customizing it. Some people are saying in their head, I wasn't expecting this. I'll just do it for a minute and then we'll get to the bar. But remember that mischief. So I'm going to add a bit of mischief. Can you imagine, right? You, you all just won the lottery, all of you, but you've read those articles in, in the newspapers that said all that money makes you unhappy. So you buy the house on a hill, you're not a rebel anymore, you don't have any wisdom. So I, I want you to throw that money to someone over the other side who looks like they might need it. I'm sure they'll use it widely. Yeah, exactly like that. You can receive as well. There's no judgment here. So here we go. Forward, back, chuck it. Get rid of it. Be happy. Yeah. Now we're going to multitask. Keep going. I'm going to call something to you 
I want you to call it back to me. Oleo. 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 Good. Now, next bit is a little bit longer. Yeah. Oleo. 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 La la. Okay, now, stay exactly, stay exactly where you are. Uh, I'd like you to pretend you're two gangs, right? <laughs> it's a standoff. So people at the back, um, shuffle forward a bit. My, yeah, yeah, exactly. This guy here, he, he's right ahead of everybody. <laughs> because you moved, you moved quicker than everybody else. You got the attitude. As soon as, as, soon as I said standoff, you went, oh, I know what that's like. If uh, classically, it's the contraposto pose, you know that? Shoulders up one way, hips the other way, the eyes the other way. <laughs> it's classic. Look it up. It, it's, it's, you know, Vogue front cover stuff. So let's be Vogue front cover rebels about to kind of celebrate something special. In style rich because you've just got lots of money yeah <laughs> look at that look at that this guy's a gangster man all right so gangster you don't have to be all political i can't even say it you don't have to be like that just be a rebel now big time okay here we go so and we're gonna rock and you're gonna show the other side that you are the best gang you've got it all right best way you Best way to build a team is set up a competition. Here we go. Remember, discipline, surrender. And what else do we want? Mischief. And get a little bit closer. Yeah. Ole, oh. Ole, oh. Ole, 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 oh, la, la. a massive round of applause. And just before I invite Ali back to the stage, will you shake hands with at least three people and say to them, I didn't realize I was here with a bunch of professional musicians. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as 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 we move towards the closing, um, let's take a moment to close our eyes and connect once more to rebel wisdom and everything that it represents in your life and it represented for you and it still does. So see if you can drop your awareness to your heart and see if you can feel the heart tingling. Think of a moment of love and connection you had. Maybe it can be today or some other time that you felt really connected in rebel wisdom. And maybe feel the love, the care, the appreciation for what Ali and David created and all of us, what a beautiful group of people. So when you're feeling your heart tingling, just seek for, for maybe it's a word, maybe it's a sentence, it's an offering from your heart to rebel wisdom. So you're pouring from your heart into the center, into the space, your love in the form of words. And we're going to do this in popcorn style and just infuse the space with our love. So whenever you're ready, whoever wants to practice the Hara courage again can go first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and it's okay if we interrupt each other. Inspiration. Brother, space, we, energy, masculinity, synthesis. <laughs> 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 Okay, so I've been asked to do one last thing to close, which I think we could just about form a circle in this room, including the stage. It won't be a perfect circle, it'll be a sort of amoeba, but let's do that. Let's be around the edges of the room, looking in, and I'm going to stop using the mic and I'm going to just walk into the middle and get us a beat going. <laughs>